I invite you to stand. We're going to join together in singing this beautiful modern hymn. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. 
Christ I stand. Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for I am with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block Hello to our friends in Melbourne. God bless you. Lovely to see you all tonight. Pretty spirited crowd, we can tell. Uh, as you know, we've been on the road, Adelaide, Brisbane and Perth. Uh, this is, um, I can tell you guys have got a bit of, bit of juice in the tank. Welcome tonight. This is the fourth chapter of the Living in Babylon tour, where Ken Ham and Mark Niles have spoken to well over 7,000 people combined uh, in the cities that I've just mentioned in the last few days. And I would say this, that one of the great privileges of being on this tour has been seeing parents bring their, bring their children. Uh, yeah. So I want you to know that if you have brought little ones with you tonight, they're most welcome, uh, because family is so important. And we know that God cares deeply about families. And yet, our society is seeking to deconstruct marriage, family and parenting, which is, why, which is why it's vital that you and I understand God's good plan for family. I pray that tonight will equip you to live faithfully, to defend your faith and your family accurately. I pray that tonight you'll be blessed and that you and your family will be a great blessing to, the, to those around them living in Babylon. Ladies and gentlemen, let us open in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would settle each heart here and uh, help us to hear and receive your word and help us to have the capacity and strength to act out on what we learn tonight. 
I pray for our speakers, Ken and Martin, that they'd be strengthened to clearly deliver the messages that you have put on their hearts. And I pray that you would be glorified tonight in everything that is said and done. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight you'll have an opportunity to participate in a live Q&A, uh, putting your questions to Ken and Martin. They'll be seated here in these lounge suites later. Uh, and um, you can put your questions in via Slido. That will be um, up on the screen from time to time. And um, yeah, we, we like the more difficult questions. Uh, they keep us on our toes. You'll also have access to a bookstore uh, during the, the intermission um, to equip you with some really world-class resources. So tonight you'll be hearing from Ken Ham first, then Martin Isles uh, after the intermission. Let me tell you something about these two speakers. Many of you, of course, will know Martin Isles. He's done a lot of work in Melbourne. He's a gospel preacher, lawyer, and cultural commentator. Australian-born, he's now the executive CEO of Answers in Genesis, based in Kentucky. He's the author of this brand new book, Who Am I? Solving the Identity Puzzle. Today, on Amazon, this book is the worldwide number one bestseller in the category Christian Theology. Well done, Martin. Dr. John MacArthur, in reviewing that book, says that man unfolds biblical truth with exquisite clarity and meticulous care. So, to introduce our first speaker, founder CEO Ken Ham, please watch with me this short historical video. You know, I first started school teaching in Australia in 1975 as a public school teacher teaching science. I had already seen that the students were looking at Christianity as, well, not valid because of what was taught in their textbooks about evolution. I was challenging them concerning that. And as I took them to these museums, I was really burdened that, why can't we have a creation museum? Every museum we go to, it's always from an evolutionary perspective. So when we began the Ministry of Answers in Genesis, really the aim in mind was to build a creation museum. Hi, I'm Ken Ham. You know, God has something very special in store for this beautiful property. In the next few minutes, I want to share with you about an exciting project that's going to equip Christians, build them up in their faith, teach them to be able to have answers for the world and to be able to show that the Bible can be taken seriously and really is the Word of God. I see the creation ministry and what it's doing in the world today really akin to what Martin Luther did at the time of the Reformation. May 26, 2007, the Creation Museum is officially open on account of three, two, two one. one. Imagine, imagine if we were to rebuild Noah's Ark, the size of the Ark, out of wood, to look like a real boat with three floors so people could walk through and see exhibits where questions would be answered, such as how did Noah fit the animals on the Ark and how do you feed them and get rid of waste products and so on, answer questions about the flood and fossils, but most of all, to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. did we come from? What was before the Big Bang? Hey, Bill, I, I just want to let you know that there, there actually is a book out there that actually tells us where matter came from. The very first sentence in that book says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I see God's hand in just so many miraculous ways. Unlikely people that he brought together in unusual ways in many instances unique circumstances, events, what we call Red Sea moments. But you know, with God, nothing is impossible. That's what his word says.
And as many of you know, of course, from first-hand experience, Ken's resources, excuse me, uh, have, have raised generations uh, of children, both in Australia and across the world. Um, Ken was last here in Melbourne in 1980, he believes. Uh, so I wonder, Melbourne, if you could give him a very warm welcome back to one of Australia's favourite sons. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, great to be back in Australia. It's interesting living in America. They play the World Series, and they're the only people that play the game. <laughs> and when you watch the uh, local news, it's all about the state you live in, and the world news includes all 50 states. <laughs> Except in 2020, for some reason, I kept seeing Melbourne on the news in Australia. <laughs> and glad that I didn't live here at that time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, interesting world we live in, isn't it? Well, we come from the ministry of Answers in Genesis, and we're ramping up the Answers in Genesis ministry here uh, in Australia. It actually started in our home in Brisbane back in 1977. And look uh, how far it's come and what God has done. We do all sorts of things with Answers in Genesis. We're an apologetics ministry, which doesn't mean we apologize for our faith. The opposite. We teach people how to defend the Christian faith, have an apologetic for the Christian faith. And we produce curricula and books and we have all sorts of outreaches and so on. We also opened the two leading Christian themed attractions in the world, uh, the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum. Uh, they're in northern Kentucky in America and the Ark Encounter is a life-size Noah's Ark. We have a conference center there as well and we have all sorts of other interesting things too. Uh, we have zip lines because Christians can have fun and carousel and we have a virtual reality ride we have a wonderful playground for children and we have a zoo at the back of the ark and I made sure that they put some real animals in the zoo as you can see They're the best animals in the world obviously and we just opened a children's zoo too and as well as running conferences through the year we have all sorts of daily program for the guests that come for all ages and we have live animal programs from a biblical worldview perspective because we know most zoos teach you from an atheistic evolutionist perspective so we have wonderful live animal programs and presenters and then the life-size ark is one and a half times the length of a football field half the width of a football field ten, stands 10 stories high at the bow end and has three decks of 130 exhibits answering all sorts of questions pointing people to the truth of god's word and the gospel and the saving gospel is presented very very clearly we have wonderful Christmas lights and programs that you won't see anywhere else. And the Creation Museum is my favorite place. It was our first attraction. And it's really like a walk through the whole Bible, answering questions, pointing people to the fact that the Bible's history is true. That's why the gospel based in that history is true. We're currently building the largest glass conservatory complex in the state of Kentucky, four big uh, glass greenhouses that'll house the plants of the Bible and an education center to go with them. We have a planetarium, state of the art, 40 theater, all sorts of exhibits, and then the premier exhibits of walking you through the whole Bible, gives you a whole history of the Bible, and then pointing people to the Lord Jesus Christ. We run programs there in our auditorium. We have an insectarium, dinosaur exhibit, and the most powerful pro-life exhibit in the world. Nothing else uh, like it. As well as that, uh, we have wonderful Christmas lights and programs that are uh, some of the best you'll ever find uh, in the USA. So who now wants to come to America to go to the Ark and the Creation Museum? Make sure you spend at least three days there. I think you probably want to spend a week there, but at least three days. Uh, they're wonderful, wonderful facilities. People come from all over the world. We're in northern Kentucky, which means you're flying to Cincinnati Airport. Cincinnati is a city in Ohio across the river, but Cincinnati Airport is in Kentucky, just to confuse everyone. And so the Cincinnati Airport's only 10 minutes from the Creation Museum. We also have our own Christian school, Answers Academy. It's a very unique Christian school. It's a discipleship school. In other words, we only allow Christians in and parents who are intentional on in discipling their children because so many Christian schools have non-Christians that impact the other kids and we want to help parents disciple their kids. So we just expanded the school. The Lord just enabled us to obtain at a very, um, very, very cheap price actually 
uh, a building that was Toyota's national headquarters and we were able to move in there and we renovated uh, the left-hand section for the school and the other will be our offices that will move there. We also have our own streaming platform and we have a way tonight where you can get an annual subscription, for, get a 12-month subscription to that totally free. I'll tell you about that at the end. We have 6,000 programs on there. I also want to thank Vision Radio. They've interviewed myself and Martin quite a number of times. I've been interviewed many times over the years. They have a booth out there. If you don't get Chris Vision Radio, I encourage you to do so because they do all sorts of interviews and have all sorts of programming on there and they love our ministry and want to support us. And um, just to mention to you, we have live streamed all the events. This is the fourth one. So we've done different messages in each place. And uh, for instance, when I was in Adelaide, the first conference, I talked about the importance of the book of Genesis. It's foundational to everything, all doctrine, our whole worldview. It's foundational to everything. People don't realize that Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for everything. We talked about why is the culture become so secular, uh, why is so much of the church lukewarm, what we can do about it, and was based on that particular book, Divided Nation, plus this one, Creation of Babel, which is a Genesis 1 to 11 commentary, verse by verse, answering all the most asked questions I've been asked in 40 years uh, that are important for us to know because once you understand the history in Genesis 1 to 11, you've got the foundation for the gospel, for our doctrine, for marriage, for, for everything. And then a brand new book that just came out, Martin's new book, his first book, Who Am I? Dealing with the identity issue. Who would have thought we'd have to have books dealing with identity or you know, helping us understand what is a woman or a man or whatever it is uh, that people have difficulties with these days. But you know, these issues are before us and we want to be able to deal with them. And then tonight, I want to give a talk that uh, is one that is said to be you know, one of the most important ones I give, I, I believe, it's dealing with the family. And this particular book, Will They Stand, I've had some of our own staff say it's the most important book they believe I've written. Will They Stand? Parenting Kids to Face the Giants. And this is sort of, if you like, the finale of this series of conferences tonight. And I thought this was important to end with this because we have major issues in regard to the family in our culture and in the church. You know, there's a lot of church issues in the Western world. There's an incredible exodus from the church. There's a generational loss from the church. If you look at the stats from America, in the 1700s, 70, 80% of the population went to church. In 2010, millennials were down to 18% church attendance. Now, 2021, Generation Z are down to less than 9%. You can see we've lost the younger generations from the church. But the same has happened in the rest of the Western world. In England, church attendance is down to less than 4%, actually. And it's interesting that in America, a Christian researcher said this, and at Generation Z, born between 1999 and 2015, the first truly post-Christian generation, even though America still has a great Christian influence, I'm sure if you watch television news, you wonder if there's anything Christian there with all the violence, what you see, but there is an incredible Christian influence. It's fallen far, but uh, Australia is so much more secular. Uh, you know, we, we call America, it's becoming more and more post-Christian. I look at Australia and I say, I think over here you're post-Christian. -post, post <laughs> That's how it seems to be. And you know, across the Western world, we see moral relativism permeate our, our culture. Who would have thought that, you know, everyday news issues would be dealing with abortion and gay marriage and pedophilia, the gender issues, and so it goes on. Euthanasia rearing its ugly head in various places. And as we look across the Western world, whether it's the United States or Canada or the United Kingdom or Australia, we see the cultures becoming less Christian, less Christianized. Instead of the Judeo-Christian ethic that permeated the West, we're seeing a secular worldview that's permeating the West. It, it reminds me of this verse of scripture in Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what is right in his own eyes. When there is no absolute authority, when you've told generations there is no God, we have generations coming through a public education system that tells them there's no God, everything happened by natural processes, then who decides right and wrong? Who decides good and bad? You do. Uh, everything is relative. It's all subjective. You decide for yourself. That's why there's this crisis in regard to identity. I, wanted to, I want to understand who I am, so I have to decide who I am. We're seeing a tornado of moral relativism that's permeating the culture and is capturing the hearts and minds of generations of our kids and generations of our kids from the church. The number of times I go to churches in America where you see the older generation that are there, but the younger generation are basically gone. And you know, the same is true in many of our churches here in Australia. And we ask a question, what happened? 
You see, what is going on? There's a war. It's a war that started in a garden 6,000 years ago. But there's a war. And we've seen that war manifest itself in a war on children. You think of the gender issues and other such things. And that's all a part of the war on the family, which is all a war on the gospel, which is all a war on God's word. It's actually a war on God. And that war on God has been raging for 6,000 years. And I want to talk about that tonight in regard to the family, in regard to generations of our kids. And a verse of scripture I want to use is Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance, or I put the word legacy in there, to his children's children. You know, a lot of times when we think of the word legacy, we think of a material inheritance. I want to challenge us tonight that the most important inheritance, if you like, to think about is that spiritual legacy. And so I want to talk about legacy. You know, at the Creation Museum, outside our auditorium called Legacy Hall, we have an exhibit called the Ham Family Legacy. It has my father's Bible there. A little Noah's Ark he built me many years ago, not knowing we would one day build a life-size ark. And I talk about the legacy of my parents. They taught us not just to stand on God's word. They taught us the gospel. They taught us the authority of the word of God. But my father made sure we knew how to defend the Christian faith. That's called apologetics. How to give answers to those who attack the Bible. And that's why the ministry of answers in Genesis has always been focused on biblical authority. You know, a lot of people have the wrong idea that, oh, answers in Genesis, you're all about fossils. You're all about the age of the earth. You're all about creation evolution. Actually, we deal with those issues because they're an attack on the authority of the word. But our whole emphasis as a ministry is standing on the authority of word of God and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. And you know, my parents passed that legacy on to us as kids, and we passed it on to our kids. We have 18 grandkids. We have one great-grandchild now, which means we're getting old, I guess. And actually, the ministry of Answers in Genesis, that conservatively speaking from our research, impacts 30 million people directly a year and tens of millions more indirectly. And through Answers in Genesis, the Ark, the Creation Museum, our Answers Academy, and so on, it's a legacy of parents who taught the next generation to stand on God's word without compromise, boldly, to courageously proclaim the gospel and to defend the Christian faith. They taught us answers so we wouldn't be led astray with those doubts that come when people are, are, have their faith attacked. You know, here in Australia, of course, we know about the Aboriginal people. You know, when they were first discovered, they're an animistic culture. But what's interesting, over the years, I remember when I was a teacher, I started teaching uh, in the town of Dolby. We're just in Dolby visiting some of our friends. Shout out to all them, and many of them watching on live stream uh, tonight out there. And I started teaching in Dolby High School. When I was a science teacher, I started collecting books from the Brit Brisbane Museum and other places that detailed some of the Aboriginal myths and legends uh, that were obtained from people who lived with them, uh, who talked to them, uh, not just from missionaries, but from many others as well. And it's interesting to read them, because as you read them, you think you're reading Genesis 1 to 11. I mean, you really do. By the way, the same is true of the American Indians and the Fijians and the Hawaiians, and you can go around the world. The army walked on the earth he had made. He made the plants and animals. He created man and woman to rule over them. Even they say he only created two genders. And then fashioned them from dust. It's interesting, he made man from dust. And then you could eat the plants, but not the animals. You know what's interesting? The Bible tells us in Genesis 1, 29 and 30, Adam and Eve were to eat plants, and the animals were eating plants. The Bible makes that very clear. They were vegetarian to start with, which is interesting, because in the fossil record, you have evidence of animals eating each other. How could that have happened millions of years before sin? When God first made everything, they were all vegetarian. You see, there's all sorts of interesting things like that. And then it talks about the flood. And the water rose up quietly from the sea until it was higher than the tallest gum tree. Well, the Bible says higher than the tallest mountain, right? It was a global flood. It wasn't any backup of the Sumer Creek or something. This was a major event. And finally, the mountain peaks disappeared. And many of them were drowned, but others were caught up by a whirlwind. So some were saved. The Bible makes it clear. Only eight people were saved on that big ship. You know, there are cultures all over the world. On the third deck of the ark, we have an exhibit uh, detailing some of the flood legends all around the world. And you know what? Many of their elements are similar to the Bible. And then, of course, you have this one from the Australian Aboriginal myths and legends. The creator spirit, he um, established a place for, for a man, his wife, to live. 
And then he had a special tree, and he said, this is my tree, and these are my bees. You can take food from anywhere, but this tree, the bees, and the honey they make, you're not, not to touch it, uh, or much evil will befall you. And then we read about the fact that the woman went closer. She couldn't resist the lure of the shining drops of the honey, and so she took some, and the evil she had done could never be remedied, the symbol of the death that afflicts all the descendants of Berekborn. It was the end of the Golden Age. What does that sound like to you? <laughs> The forbidden tree, right? And the judgment of death because of sin. People, do you realize those sorts of legends exist in cultures all over the world? You know the sad thing in public schools and in universities? You know what students are taught? You know what I was taught when I went to uh, the Qu Queensland University of Technology and so on? Oh, yes, um, there, there are, uh, are legends uh, that uh, are similar to the Bible. The Jews have uh, stories, they said, similar uh, you know, to the Babylonians. It's obviously uh, that the Jews borrowed their stories from the Babylonians. No, 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 it's the other way around. <laughs> if you read the account of the Babylonians, for instance, they, they might have this ship of the flood that was a cube seven stories high. That doesn't sound like a ship that would float. It makes sense, but the Bible has one that has a six to one ratio and, and you read the description and water came from, from below and water from above, whereas some of these other legends have gods cutting each other in half and so, no, it's the Bible that's obviously true. The others are perversions of the biblical text. And when you take that biblical history, God made Adam and Eve and then they had sons and daughters. By the time of the flood, there was only eight people that went on that ship, they came off that ship but they gave rise to more people. They rebelled at an event called the Tower of Babel, forming different cultures, different people groups uh, all over the world, not different races, because if we all go back to Adam and Eve, back to one man and one woman, we're all one race, which science has shown, by the way, that all humans belong to one race. And so there's no different races, which means we're all related to each other, which means if we're not of the Aboriginal community, we're still related to them, they're still our family, and then when you start to think about this, you realize, wait a minute, their great-great-granddaddy a long time ago was the same as mine. He was a man called Noah, and he had the knowledge of God. What happened? What happened? Well, they obviously lost that knowledge of the true God, as have many other cultures around the world. And here's a challenge for us. How long does it take to lose that spiritual legacy? It only takes one generation. And I want to challenge us as parents, and I want to challenge the young people here tonight, it only takes one generation to lose that spiritual legacy. And let me give you an example from Scripture. When Joshua led the people, it was a miracle of the Lord, they crossed the Jordan River, and Joshua led the people across the Jordan River, then God said to Joshua, get 12 people from the tribes of Israel and get 12 stones out of the middle of Jordan because this was a fast flowing river so get 12 stones from the middle because you walked across on dry land and what do these stones mean? You are to take these 12 stones and build a memorial, they're to be a sign, a memorial, what for? To remind the next generation of what God did so that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, what do these stones mean? You will let your children know. Make sure you pass on the truth of God and what He has done and who He is to the next generation. Make sure you do that. Build that memorial so when they see it, you will be reminded to pass on that spiritual legacy to the next generation. You are to let your children know. And by the way, we will find out that they didn't do that. And I believe the same is happening today. You see, we are to pass on that spiritual legacy to the next generation. But we're going to find out that the uh, Israelite fathers didn't do what they should have and they lost them in one generation. But there's one other aspect. Let your children know, and then look at this other aspect. And so that all the peoples of the earth may know. You see, we are to pass on that spiritual legacy to impact the next generation so they will impact the world to tell them the truth about God. And then they will raise up a generation who will also impact the world. And they will raise up a generation who will impact the world. And what happens if you don't pass on that spiritual legacy? Then you don't impact the world. Then you lose it. And you lose those generations. So that all the peoples of the earth may know. You know, when we opened the Ark Encounter, it looks a lot different today, it was pretty bare back then, but July 5, 2016, I had our board members lay 12 stones. And here's a little bit of what I said at the opening. Quite a number of years ago, there was a man called Joshua. 
He led the people of Israel across the Jordan River and God told them to take 12 stones and to build a memorial as a reminder so that the coming generations would not forget who God is and to also be a reminder to the world. The ark is to be a reminder. We build it as a reminder. It's our 12 stones to remind the coming generations of the truth of God's word. It's our way of presenting the truth of God's word and the gospel to the world. And it has impacted millions of people. We get 1.2 million people right now a year at the Ark Encounter and 600,000 or so at uh, the Creation Museum. It's an incredible impact. But you know, sadly, we read in Scripture the next generation was not reminded. Because we read in Judges, the people that served uh, the Lord all the days of Joshua, while Joshua was alive, those people, all the elders of those who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of the Lord, well, here they are, and then Joshua dies, and then the elders die. So the generation that were gathered to their fathers, that saw all those things, that experienced them, they died. Then there arose another generation, their children, who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel, and the people did Israel, did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and went after other gods. It only took one generation, and they lost it because the fathers didn't teach the children. They didn't pass on that spiritual legacy. And I believe the same is happening today. A lot of fathers are not the spiritual head of their house. We'll talk about that in a moment. They haven't taken on that role that they should, that Scripture has commanded. They've just handed their kids over to the public education system or media or games on TV or whatever it is. And, and many of them just hope that maybe, you know, at church on, on, on one day a week, maybe they'll get enough to, you know, give them some Christian stuff. And they're more interested in what they're doing during the day or whatever it is. But how much are we putting into the next generation as we should? You know, it's interesting, in Victoria here, back in 2014, there was an atheist, Lawrence Krauss, who spoke to a secular group in Australia at the Victorian Skeptics Cafe, and he said this, change is only one generation away. You know, I wish Christians understood that. The atheists understand it. Change is only one generation away. And if we can plant the seeds of doubt, oh, you know what that sounds like to me? That sounds exactly like the devil. In Genesis 3, verse 1, the seeds of doubt, did God really say? Then in our children, religion, when he says religion, they mean Christianity most times. Christianity will go away in a generation, or at least largely go away, and that's what I think we have an obligation to do. Our obligation is we want to capture the children for atheism. And you know what? They've been very successful. They've been successful in doing that even from kids from the church. Very successful. You know, back in the Garden of Eden, a battle began 6,000 years ago. God said to the first man, Adam, as a test of obedience, you can do it of all the trees, just one you're not to eat of, because if you do, you'll surely die. And the devil came along and said, did God actually say? I want you to notice something. Do you know what the first attack was? It was on the authority of the word of God to get Adam and Eve to doubt God's word so that doubt would lead to unbelief and then you'll be like God, you'll be your own God. You decide things for yourself. There's no king, you're the king, you decide everything. Trust man's word. And a battle began between two religions or two foundations. That battle has been raging ever since. In an ultimate sense, there's only two religions. There aren't hundreds of religions. In an ultimate sense, there's only two you trust man or you trust God. You see it all the way through Scripture. Build your house on the rock, build your house on the sand. Light, darkness, for Christ, against. Gather, scatter. Choose you this day in which God you will serve. I mean, all the way through Scripture, man's word, God's word. That's the battle. And in 2 Corinthians 11.3, the Apostle Paul, which is God's word, has a warning for us that the devil is going to use the same method on us, which means on our children as he did on Eve, to get you to a position of not believing the things of God, what's the method going to be? It's going to be to create doubt in regard to the Word of God. And I believe the teaching of evolution and millions of years that has been ignored by much of the church, many of our pastors have said, it doesn't matter, don't worry about Genesis, they've compromised with evolution. Many have ignored that has been one of the greatest attacks on biblical authority in our era. And we wonder why we're losing generations of kids. Did God actually say? See, 
change one generation away if we can plant the seeds of doubt there it is that's the devil you know Hitler said he alone who owns the youth gains a future because he knew if you can capture the next generation you'll have the culture and people that's been successfully done by the devil in Australia in America in the whole Western world the younger generations have been captured by the enemy and you know when you consider all these issues it doesn't matter what they are do you realize they're all an attack on the family and we can even add to that if you wanted to COVID lockdowns because they were an attack on the family too incredibly destructive as they found in America and I'm sure you found over here do you realize the family is the first and most fundamental of all human institutions which God ordained in Scripture let me say that again the family is the first and most fundamental of all human institutions which God ordained in Scripture don't you think therefore that's telling you something about its importance and the family was founded in Genesis when God said he made the first man and woman male and female no other options by the way do you see there's only two options male and female that's reiterated in Matthew 19 when Jesus was asked about marriage he said haven't you read he made them male and female and then God formed man from dust you see he said it's not good that man should be alone you know um, the animals weren't made in the image of God only Adam and Eve were made in the image of God and that's why God brought the animals to Adam to name to show there was none like him he didn't look at a female chimp and say you know she's close enough I could date her <laughs> no he couldn't find a helper so God put him to sleep and from his side he made the first woman woman came from man man didn't come from an ape man you can't add evolution to the Bible man came from dust and we return to dust when we die we don't return to an ape man woman came from man she didn't come from an ape woman in fact in the New Testament Paul says twice in 1 Corinthians 11 woman came from man you can't add evolution to the Bible by doing so you destroy the whole basis of the family you destroy the basis of marriage how many of our churches are teaching this how many are teaching that solid foundation as they should and you know when we come to Genesis 2 24 therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and there'll be one flesh that's the creation of marriage God created marriage not the premier not the prime minister not the president of the United States God created marriage and you know what there's only one marriage he created therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and two will be one flesh a man and a woman one man one woman do you realize there's no such thing as gay marriage you know when people talk about gay marriage if I write about gay marriage I put the word marriage in quotes because it is not marriage there is only one marriage God made marriage it's a man and a woman and do you realize you can only speak that boldly about it and that courageously about it if you believe Genesis 1 to 11 is literal history because that's the foundation for marriage it's not just the foundation for marriage do you realize every single biblical doctrine of theology directly or indirectly is founded in Genesis 1 to 11 where's the origin of sin Genesis 1 to 11 death Genesis 1 to 11 why did Jesus die on a cross Genesis 1 to 11 why is he called the last Adam Genesis 1 to 11 why do you all wear clothes God gave clothes because of sin Genesis 1 to 11 why do we have a seven-day week Genesis 1 to 11 why does man have dominion over the creation and not the other way around as the climate change cultists are telling us today because that is an anti-god religion you know people say to me well don't you believe in climate change of course I believe in climate change there's been climate change ever since the flood it caused massive climate change and the ice age generated by the flood there's been climate change because this is a fallen world you know you've got to understand biblical history and man has dominion over the creation not the other way around you know think of Romans 1 when people reject God they worship the creation which is what we see happening today Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for everything and our churches should have been teaching it to us it's the foundation for the rest of the Bible for all doctrine for our Christian worldview for the gospel for everything and you know it's the foundation for marriage it's the foundation for the family the first and most fundamental of all human institutions and God said then to Adam and Eve be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth so let me ask you a question 
according to the scripture, what's one of the primary importances of marriage? One of the primary importances? Well, in Malachi we read there, the prophet is telling us, the people, the Israelite men, they were, mar- they were divorcing their wives, they were committing polygamy, they were marrying pagans, and the prophet asked a question, this is God's word, why did he make them one? It's a reference back to the fact that two became one, it's a reference back to the creation of Eve from Adam, and the creation of marriage. In other words, why did he make marriage? He, what was he seeking from their union? What was the one God seeking? And you know what the answer is? Not just offspring, but godly offspring. Godly offspring. That should convict each one of us. Godly offspring. 2 Corinthians 6.14 is a principle we need to apply to marriage. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What fellowship is law, righteousness with lawlessness or light with darkness? In other words, we don't mix light and darkness... So a godly person should only look on a godly person in marriage and should never knowingly marry an ungodly person. So they can produce godly offspring who marry godly offspring who produce godly offspring who marry godly offspring who produce godly offspring who marry godly offspring offspring, generation after generation passing on a spiritual legacy and impacting the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we should be doing. And so I want to ask us a question, how do, how do we produce godly offspring, how do we raise children? And you know, you can read all sorts of books on this, but I'm going to challenge us this way. I've had people tell me, well, I think this, well, I think we should be doing this, or I think we should be doing... I get so tired of people telling me what they think they should do. I say to them, it's not a matter of what you think, what does God's Word say? See, if you truly understand a Christian worldview and what the Bible is, you don't start outside the Bible and take your ideas to the Bible and say, now let's see what that says. You start from the Bible to build a true Christian worldview. And I want to do that very briefly. Some of the things my wife and I have studied over the years. For instance, parental roles. Well, let's look first of all at who owns children. Who does own children? Because in America, the President of the United States says he owns the children. Or the teachers at the school, the secular schools own the children. No, no, no. Behold, children are an heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. No, they belong ultimately to God, and he has entrusted them to parents. When President Biden claims that school children don't belong to parents when they're in the classroom, that is just simply not true, and that is a secular worldview saying, we want to capture your children. And how many hours a day do they have them, compared to what we put into them? You know, Isaiah 38, 9... You know, in America, I have to remember to say Isaiah. I hate that. Isaiah. Eyes in the middle after, well, almost the middle. Anyway. The father makes known to the children your faithfulness. Fathers, do not provoke your children in anger. Bring them up in the discipline instruction of the Lord. And Psalm 78. I would encourage you all to go home. Husbands and wives, sit down, read through Psalm 78 tonight before we go to bed. That we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. Tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and wonders he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob. He commanded our fathers to teach their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God and not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose heart wasn't steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. They forgot his works and the wonders he had shown them. They didn't pass it on to the next generation. They lost it and then the next generation served Baal and then it's, it's, it's so hard to even start to get that back. But that's no different to today. See, the Bible makes it very clear. Fathers are to be the spiritual head of their home. I'm not saying that. The Bible says that. How many fathers have taken on that God-given role and that you make sure that you are bringing up your children, that you're a priest to your wife and your family and you're raising them up on the Word of God and you're teaching them to be able to defend the Christian faith to survive in this pagan world and not be captured by the enemy. Most of our generations from the church have been captured by the enemy. You know, what if we deal with a topic like equality? Are men and women equal? Oh, that's an interesting question. Let me ask you. Don't call out. Just think in your own mind. Are men and women equal? Well, you know what I would say? 
It depends. It depends on what? It depends on what Scripture says. First of all, it's obvious men and women are equal in value before the Lord. Men and women equally offered the free gift of salvation. Of course they're equal. But they don't have equal roles. The feminists want equal roles. They don't have equal roles. Are we prepared to accept the role God has ordained for men and for women? Not our opinion, but what God has ordained. For instance, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her that he might satisfy her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word. Husbands, do you know what one of your roles is? Think about it. Love your wife as Christ loved the church and died for the church. Uh, do you have that sacrificial love for your wife that you'd be prepared to die for her, that you pour out that love on your wife? That's what we're told to do. That's a, a man's role. And wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. And so the whole marriage relationship is, is then related to Christ and the church. Do we look on that and say, okay, as a man, as a woman, what is my role? What is my role? Am I being obedient to Scripture? Or do we just do our own thing? Or we've been impacted by the feminist movement. By the way, where is the feminist movement and all this transgender sports stuff? Where are they? Are they hiding? I haven't seen them around. And you know, this is a principle we can apply to marriage as well. Submitting to one another. You know what, men, you have to submit to your wife in the role God's ordained for her. Women, you submit to your husband in the role God has ordained for you. We submit to each other. But you know what? We need to be aware of something. We live in a fallen world and sin distorts everything. And sin distorts those roles. See, you've got to understand what happened in Genesis and that because of our sin, now everything changed. Think about Cain. Before he killed his brother Abel, God warned him, Cain, sin is crouching at the door. Sin wants to master over you. Don't let it master over you. You are to master over it. Its desire is to get, to get you and master over you. No, don't do that. But he let it master over him. And he killed his brother Abel. You know, sin every day wants to master over us in every area of our life, which is why every day we need to be looking to the Lord Jesus Christ to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ and make sure we judge our behavior and what we think and believe against the absolutes of God's word or sin can master over our lives. In Genesis 3.16, so this is after Adam sinned, after the fall, to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing, and pain you shall bring forth children. And it's true, in humans, women have a lot of physical pain uh, in childbirth. My wife was spared some of that because she had these precipitous labours, and I had to deliver our second child on the lounge in Sunnybank, Brisbane, not by choice, she just decided to take 38 minutes, and that was it. <laughs> there I am. What do I do? I remember watching the movies. You hold them up by their legs, whack them on the bottom. I did that. She cried, and I thought, oh, that worked. <laughs> and then, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. People, this is a fallen world we live in. In other words, the wife did not submit to the husband because, you see, Eve took the fruit, she was deceived, but the husband was the head. He was the one who was told not to eat the fruit, which he should have told Eve. Sometimes I think, you know, Adam was sort of standing by there and saying, oh, she's going to take the fruit. Let me see what happens. If she doesn't die, then it's okay, I guess. <laughs> but, you see, it's a reminder for women to be submissive to their husbands in the role God gave them, and men to be head of their house in the role God gave it. But, you know what, there's a problem in a fallen world because, because of sin, men then take that role and distort it and they tend to lord it despotically over the woman. And a lot of women want to be the head instead of the man and so there's this continual battle which is why as Christians we need to step back and say, wait a minute, I'm not going to let sin master over me and distort those roles. When it comes to training children, I like to use salt. Because see, the scripture says you're the salt of the earth. 
You know, when we first send our kids to a Christian school, we, our kids have been involved in Christian school and homeschool, and we have our own Christian school, I have m- many people in the church said, wait a minute, you should be sending your kids to the public schools. And I said, why is that? Where to be the salt of the earth? They should be out there being salt. But I've got news for you. The Bible says, have salt in yourselves. Here's a very simple statement. You can't be salt till you have it. Right? I mean, when our kids were born, I mean, the first time our first son was born in 1976 in Dolby, I looked at him in his his little bassinet there, and he looked at me and said, hey, Dad, what do you use eschatology and soteriology? And we had this great theological discussion. No, you know what hit me? He, he, He didn't know about the Bible. He didn't know about sin, about Adam's fall. He didn't know about the promise of the Savior. He didn't know about the flood of Noah's day, or the Tower of Babel, or the call of Abraham, or the babe in a manger, or the cross, or the resurrection, or the new heavens and new earth to come. He didn't know any of that. You know what God's word says in Romans? It's evident to all that he's creator if you don't believe without excuse. And in Romans 2, the law is written on our hearts, so we know what's right and what's wrong. We have a conscience, so we're without excuse. But our job as parents is to put that salt in them. And that's what we do, you know, at the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter, We're giving people answers to the attacks of the world and teaching them the truth of God's word and building a Christian worldview based on the Bible back to Genesis 1 to 11. At the Creation Museum, we walk you through the history in the Bible from creation through to consummation. And those first four C's, that's Genesis 1 to 11, that's the foundation for our Christian worldview. That's the foundation for everything. And I'm going to challenge us that we need to be raising up generations. Go back to the talk I did in Adelaide, which does this in detail. We need to be raising up generations who think foundationally, starting from the Bible and Genesis 1 to 11, pouring in that salt of biblical truth, but also teaching them apologetics. In other words, saying, how is the devil going to attack God's word today? What is he doing to, to cause that doubt? And I need to be preparing them, which is why we have all those books out there and why we have the ark and the museum and the curricula, to give you those answers so that they will stand on God's word, defend the Christian faith, and won't be led astray. You know, in America, I like to use the example of Vegemite, and I tell them it's an exotic food. <laughs> and... Most Australians love Vegemite. When you give it to an American, they think it's the most disgusting thing ever, particularly if you give them a whole teaspoonful and they think it's sweet and just say, hey, just take the whole lot. Sends them to the moon and back. I've had people tell me it destroyed their taste buds for years. But you know, our parents, when we were little babies and growing up, would get a little bit of Vegemite and put it in their mouth and teach us to acquire a taste for Vegemite. So we get hooked on Vegemite, right? We've done the same with our grandkids. We don't want them to miss out on the best things of life. And (laughs) so we've trained them that way. And we have a whole generation of grandkids that are hooked on Vegemite. Hey, you know what it reminds me of? 2 Timothy 3, how from a childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. You see, if you don't start right from when your children are born, and that's what we do with our kids, and we would show them books, and we'd show them pictures, and we'd teach what was in Scripture, and we'd show them books on dinosaurs from a creationist perspective. And we would teach them, and as they grew up, they loved those books, and then they'd read them for themselves. But we started pouring that salt in, and right from a young age, we were saying, what, what are they going to be told today that's going to, going to be used to try to create doubt in regard to the Scriptures? And we, we would teach them as they, as they uh, were able to be old enough to understand how to defend the Christian faith and answers to all these attacks today so that they would become mature adults able to challenge non-Christians and build up Christians. But you know, we have problems in a fallen world. Sin distorts everything. We all have a sin nature. In sin did my mother conceive me. We're born contaminated. A lot of people think children are basically good. One of the problems in America with the whole defund the police movement is they, they've got this idea, people are basically good, improve their environment, and they'll, they'll be good. You improve their environment, and it gets worse. Because they're not dealing with the issue, which is our sin nature. And by the way, you find that out pretty quick, really, with kids. And you see, the problem that we found is as we poured that salt in and taught them, it poured out the bottom pretty quickly. (laughs) Because do you realize something? Look at your own kids and look at yourself. And you know what you say when you look at them? Their heart is they don't want the truth. Do you realize that? Because they don't. Because our heart is we don't want the truth. 
Because that's the nature of man. And that's another reason why be careful who they mix with. It's one of the reasons why we are very careful who we let into our Christian school because bad company corrupts good character. You know, Scripture teaches us that. In other words, the bad is more likely to influence the good than the good the bad. It's very important to understand that. See, when you think about the broad way and the narrow way, a lot of people think, oh, uh, you know, there's a broad way and here's the narrow way. But actually, the broad way is the whole world. The narrow way is within the world. And the forces that are going against our children are so great that, Dad, you have to use incredible discernment and diligence and work hard and do the best you can to be able to drag them in the other direction. And understand, children are not miniature adults. When I thought was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave away childish ways. Children are not miniature adults. Children are children. And yet, you know what they're doing in the United States? Children should be allowed to decide for themselves what gender they want to be. Do you do that, do you do that by taking them out to the motorway and saying, you decide if you want to cross it. You can decide if you want to be potty trained or not. Hey, you can decide what you want to eat. Rat poison, you know, you decide. Of course not. And yet, we're telling them they can decide about gender? You see, that's what happens when you abandon God's word. And you know, the Bible warns us about contamination. If the salt loses its taste, and it does that through contamination, how will you make it salty again? The sad thing is, we have allowed generations of our kids to be contaminated by the public education system, by the media, by the television, by compromising Christian leaders who've taught them against God's word in Genesis. And they become contaminated adults that non-Christians lap it up and Christians, well, they're no longer having an impact on the culture. You see... If you truly understand God's word, the way we should be raising up children is starting from God's word to build a Christian worldview. But actually, most of them have been taught a secular worldview and we try to add God in up the top here. It's one of the reasons I'm so against using secular textbooks because they have the wrong foundation. You can't Christianize a worldview from the top down. You've got to start from the foundation up. You don't add dinosaurs to the Bible. You start from the Bible to understand dinosaurs. You don't add death and suffering to the Bible and say, how do we understand this? You start from the Bible to build the right way of thinking about death and suffering. You've got to start from the word of one who knows everything has always been there. And remember, Scripture says, we are here to influence the world. Remember, raise up generations who are godly who will also impact the world. What did the Lord say to Jeremiah? Don't learn the ways of the heathen. Learn not their ways. We're here to influence the world, not the world, us. And you look at the Israelites and you say, how could they have done this? They, 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 look, look what happened. Look what God did for them. And yet they adopted their pagan ways. They adopted their idols, their child sacrifice. My people inquire of a piece of wood. And what did God say to them? I despise your feasts. I won't accept your offerings. I'm not going to listen to your music, your praise songs. God is withdrawn from them. I'll send a famine on the land, a famine of the hearing of the words of the Lord. You'll lose your children. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. People, I want to challenge us. This is what's happened today in the church. Are not compromising Christians doing the same things? We've raised up generations and told them, Genesis doesn't matter. You can believe what you're taught at school about evolution of millions of years. You can believe the secularists. You can believe the atheists who want to capture you. That's okay. Just trust in Jesus. And yet the authority of the word has been undermined. And I think God is saying this. You can bring all your offerings. You can have all your praise teams out the front. I'm not going to listen to them. If you don't obey my word. If you don't teach my word. He's withdrawn from them. I'm going to send a famine on the land of the hearing of the words of the Lord. Do you realize one of the most asked questions we get asked in America, and actually I've been asked it here in Australia too, do you know a church in our area that takes the same stand you do and teaches God's word the way you do because we can't find one? There's a famine in the land. Now there are some that are there. There's, there's some in, in Australia in, in every state. There's some in, in America, but they're a minority. 
People are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And we're losing the younger generation. We're losing our children. We're losing that spiritual legacy. And I want to leave you with this. What's the most important thing for any one of us? What's the most important thing for our children? What's the most important thing for any one of us? You know what Paul says? I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. The most important thing for your children and for you is that they and you know, know Christ because people, that's their eternity. This life is nothing compared to eternity. It's, it's, it's not even a drop in the bucket. Compared to eternity, it is nothing. And yet we get so wound up for the material things in this world, so wound up with our own fleshly desires, so wound up with our own materialistic uh, lusts or whatever we have. The most important thing is that you and your children know Christ. Like these parents at this convention, my son's a doctor, my daughter's a movie star, my kids are all rich, my kids love the Lord. I'm not against academia, don't get me wrong, all our kids have college degrees. But I tell you what, I would rather them be ditch diggers and go to heaven than some famous academic or rich person and go to hell. And I want to leave you with this and then I want to tell you how we can help you in, in training your children. And I want to show you just a really short video clip. I know I've gone over time just a little bit, but I'll cut the next bit down. So, I want you to think about this. Can you imagine God brought the animals to the ark, the different kinds. Noah and his family went on the ark, eight people. But the whole world had rebelled against God. And they were outside the ark. And you know what it says? God shut the door. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he'll be saved. Noah's ark is a picture of salvation. I want you to think right now, are you in that ark of salvation? Are your children in that ark of salvation? I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he'll be saved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Have you put your faith and trust in the Lord? Where are your children? Because what if that door shut tonight? Because that door is going to shut again in the future when Jesus returns and there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. And I want you to think, where am I? Where are my children? What if they were outside the ark? We need to do all we can. And everyone has to answer for their own sins. But we need to do all we can before the Lord to direct them to the door of the ark. To go inside that door. a sobering fact to think about isn't it so are you inside the ark are your children inside the ark what are you doing to direct your children into that ark of salvation the Lord Jesus Christ there's nothing more important nothing that's more important well you know one of the things that uh, we're going to do for you uh, tonight uh, we have a, a friend in America um, and uh, his name is uh, Gary Kim, and he works for 316 Publishing, and they have produced the Legacy Standard Bible, which is an update of the New American Standard Translation. And I've always wanted, I've always had this burden when people hand out New Testament Psalms and Proverbs to put Genesis in there. 
Because it's the foundation for everything. It should be in there. So he produced these Bibles specially for us, the Legacy Standard Bible with Genesis at the beginning, and the New Testament Psalms and Proverbs. Every one of you can take one free of charge tonight, courtesy of 316 Publishing. Um, so the reason, the reason we left that, you have to be at the end, after the question time, then you can get, the reason we left it to the end, because we knew no one would stay to hear Martin uh, if we, <laughs> so anyway. Very quickly, um, we have a virtual bookstore. Uh, to ship stuff around to Australia is incredibly expensive, and we've got all these books arriving on the 12th, and we've done this in the other states, and, and people love it. We're, if, whatever you order tonight, we will ship to you as soon as they are, the books are arriving on the 12th, actually, from America, and then we'll ship them out to you, and free shipping, and we already discounted them. So who am I? Divided Nation, I mentioned these at the beginning, plus... Uh, the answers book, so I mentioned this one, this one, and this one, and this one is 25 of the most asked questions people ask to cause doubt in regard to the Bible. Um, those four books you can get at a special discounted price, and if you order a pack, we will give you a 12-month subscription to Answers TV free, and that's valued at $80 Australian. And then I have a book called Divine Dilemma Dealing with the Death and Suffering Issue, finding through a real-life example from our own family. How do you deal with that? It's got answers many other books do not have and goes through my mother and dealing with the death of a younger brother and so on. This one that I did tonight in more detail. Also books for children. Why did God make me a boy and a girl? And then this one's on evangelism. You can't just go out and say you sin or repent of your sin when they don't know what sin is. We have generations that don't know what the Bible is. This challenges us to use a method of evangelism Paul used in Acts 17 to reach people today. This is the best value, and you get that highly discounted plus a free 12-month subscription. That works out at like $300 value to Answers TV, which has 6,000 programs on there, wholesome programming instead of Netflix. And... Uh, Wonderful program for all ages, and we're adding new programs every day. And the way you do this, you can you fill out that form that you got on your seats there, have it ready, go out in the break to where uh, all the people are out there helping you to get that. They'll take your details. You can uh, use your credit card and uh, get that. Um, and also, um, you can... Uh, we'll have a QR code up on the screen, you can order it from your seat. You can go out there and have a look at the books or whatever, but then you can come back and order it from uh, your seat. And uh, so look for the handout on your chair. There's the QR code there. Uh, you can even, you know, when it comes up on the screen, you can even take a, a picture of the QR code, you know, get that link to it and then save the link and you can order later. Or if you go to the live stream, it'll be in the live stream, obviously. And then take that free book as you go, uh, the free Bible. I encourage you to visit... Uh, Vision Christian Radio, become familiar with them. And then uh, on livinginbabylon.com, you can go back and see all uh, the conference programs that we've done in each of the cities. So there'll be a total of eight of them. And uh, I praise the Lord for all of you coming tonight. And I'll hand over for the announcements, and then Martin will give his session. We'll have the Q&A, and, &A, and uh, we'll have a great night together. And I uh, trust we really get the message. This is not just an ordinary book. This is the authoritative word of God. And this is the message everyone needs. The most important message of all. The message of salvation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, put your hands together for Ken. What a legend. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take an intermission. And this is your opportunity to start submitting your questions to Ken and Martin. Uh, through Slido and Centre Stage, we'll keep the bookstores so you can, you know, um, conduct that from your seats and you can put your questions in as well. Your 30 minutes starts now and um, we'll see you then uh, with your uploaded questions and Martin Isles. Thank you.
what, what? What? Welcome to Building Blocks. If this is more dense, it should flow down and extinguish all of these candles. She depends on the warm sunshine to warm her up or the cool shade to cool her down. If I were still teaching worldview classes at high school, I would show this movie. You can't Christianize a worldview that has a wrong foundation. Welcome to our program. It's called Out and About, and I'm your host, Buddy Davis. I'm Peter Schremer, and this is I Can See. It's really important for every Christian to understand this issue. We're coming up the drainage here of Carbon Creek. We've got to go left and climb up this scree slope where there's steps. The question we want to answer with this research was whether the, the sediments were still soft or had they hardened when the rocks were bent. You would expect if the folding took place 480 million years later, those rocks would have broken they were brittle and they would have fractured and broken when they were bent, which isn't what we observe megascopically. So the only way to be able to investigate this is to actually take samples, look at the grains and the texture under the microscope. We can't find any detailed uh, analysis of this rock layer in the literature. So, it, you know, it hasn't even been done. And you would think the Grand Canyon, of all places, the mecca of geologists, some of the basics haven't been done. Well, it's just an interesting area that we want to try to, to sample. Okay. So we're going to take a sample right where this bed is kind of smeared up in here. It's heavy. And so, yes, I have high hopes that this project will confirm that the layers were soft when they were bent, and therefore, because the whole sequence of layers had to be formed 
before the folding took place, it wasn't over you know, 480 million years, it was only over the time span of the flood. As a Christian, I believe that God's word is a record, an eyewitness account of what happened, and therefore, as a scientist, I can expect that the evidence in God's world is going to confirm what we already read in his word. Well done. Yeah. Well, Andrew, here we are. <laughs> what do you have to say? Well done, everyone. Fantastic trip.
This is gonna be so fun. I can't wait. It sounds like a blast. How about you? Getting excited yet? Of course. You know me. I'm up for literally anything, even if it might be a little boring. What? Boring? Gracie, tell her! Yeah, were you not listening? There's so much to do! Zip lines, ice cream, virtual reality, a zoo, and just wait till you go inside. <laughs> I guess you'll just have to see it for yourself. Well, Liz, here we are. The big moment of truth. <gasps> wow. Increíble. <laughs> Buenazo. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Let's do this. <laughs> Try and keep up, girls. Told you, Izzy. Sometimes you just gotta think bigger. <sighs> it sure is good to be back.
I'd like to invite you to make your way back to your seat, uh, but you won't need to sit down as I'd like you to stand also as we sing again in praise to our God. To God be the glory, great things He hath done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth be Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Great things He hath taught us, great things He hath done, and great our rejoicing. Through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the peace. Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Amen. Please be seated. Daniel chapter 6. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault, because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel, unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed 
that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within thirty days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, the thing stands fast, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed, and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian.
Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen of Melbourne. Um, <laughs> Melbourne is our city of finales, you know. Whenever we need to do a grand finale, for some reason, our minds always go to Melbourne. Um, and I think it's because we know you'll come, I think it's because we know you'll uh, be a great crowd, and also because we know Melbourne needs it. <laughs> I was, I was pumping you up and up and down. So, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it is an incredible city, Melbourne, and I think you all know that. Um, of course, blighted by uh, a spiritual darkness. Um, but all the more reason to be here, uh, and all the more reason to praise God that we are here, uh, because when it is dark, the light shines all the brighter. Uh, and that is very relevant to my talk this evening. I am talking about Christian witness... Christian testimony in a dark world, in a Babylon-type culture. Um, in Adelaide, we looked at Daniel chapter 3, uh, which is the account of uh, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the fiery furnace, and we learned a number of things there. Uh, in particular, we learned that God very often works in the fires and He works in the lion's dens. Uh, he didn't deliver Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego from the fire, uh, he didn't uh, let them die in the fire, uh, he took them through the fire and it was in taking them through the fire that he did a great work in them and he did a great work in Babylon. Uh, and that's a great clarifier for us. Uh, God may need people to stand in fires and lion's dens and we're going to talk about the lion's den tonight. Uh, then in uh, Brisbane, we looked at Daniel 5, which is the tragic chapter of Belshazzar's feast where we realise that every Babylon, every culture, every part of this earth is ultimately judged um, and we need to live in the light of that. Belshazzar was a man who did not live in the light of his own judgement and so his life is recorded as a warning to all of us uh, that we must respond to the day of God's mercy uh, in a culture that provokes him every day while we can. Uh, and all, nobody needs to despair because Nebuchadnezzar was converted in Babylon but everybody is warned because Belshazzar resisted the grace of God to the end. Uh, and then in Perth we looked at uh, Daniel chapter 7 and we saw that there is a great clash of kingdoms playing out in our day. Uh, we saw that God describes the uh, rolling uh, uh, rise and fall of the kingdoms and the powers of this earth as a rise and a fall of beasts and blasphemers, uh, those who are beastly and violent and those who are blasphemous and proud, uh, but of course there is another kingdom which is above them all, which is unmoved and unshaken and we all are called to serve that king and serve that kingdom and when everything else has fallen away and judged, that will remain and we will remain uh, and what a great hope that is. Now tonight, I'm going to talk to you about Daniel chapter 6 um, and just to give you a teaser, uh, as a, as a, uh, before I uh, get there, I just want to say Daniel chapter 6 chronologically is the last chapter of Daniel. It ends with Cyrus the Persian, which is the king under whose reign Daniel died and in Daniel 1 through 6 you get chronology, uh, in Daniel 7 to the end you get a different view of history you get a an heavenly, an eternal, God's view of history, an unveiling of what's happening in the spiritual world and there's a rehearsing of some of the stuff that's already happened and also it takes you all the way into the future as well. And so Daniel 6, in a way, is a finale uh, and that's why I'm dealing with it tonight. But before I get there, and it's the account of one man's testimony in a very hostile culture to that testimony. But before I get there, I need to uh, give us some basics and the basics uh, uh, really relate to, well, what do I mean when I say living in Babylon? What do I mean by Babylon? Well, it's the same as saying, well, what does Scripture mean by Babylon? And of course, first and foremost, Scripture is talking about a place, it's talking about an ancient empire in which Daniel and his friends lived. Uh, and historically, there's a lesson for us because actually Babylon was the place where Daniel and his friends were called to live faithfully for God and bear fruit for God in a new context, in a new culture. You know, they had come from uh, Jerusalem and Jerusalem was a culture which still had remnants of kind of a God-fearing basis, God-fearing foundations. 
little bit like the West, you know, we've still got institutions that have sort of Christian influence that started them. We still have a political system that was heavily influenced by Christian thought and Christian people. The West is still the place from which missionaries went and evangelized the world. The West is still the place where we saw great Christian states people and all the rest of it. The West is full of a Christian foundation and for Daniel and his friends, they came from the city of God, Jerusalem. There's a place that is full of a God-fearing foundation, a godly foundation. But what happens, a new culture comes along and in his case, it was a military conquest. Uh, In our case, it's not a military conquest, it's an ideological one. And what's happened is that the culture changes and it changes radically and it goes from God-fearing to God-opposing very quickly. And in the case of Babylon, it's a pagan place And Daniel and his friends may have wished with all their hearts that Babylon would fail and go away, but it just didn't. It was there for a while. Uh, And they were called to be faithful to God and fruitful for God in a new context, in a new culture, in a God-opposing culture. And it changes the calculus, you know, of how you think about life, Uh, sometimes in a very good way, as we shall see. Uh, There's a lot of parallels just in that experience with our experience in the Western world. Uh, It is an ideological conquest that we see today. People call it woke, you know, it's lots of things. Uh, It's postmodernism, an attack on objective truth. Uh, It's critical theories, uh, uh, labelling all of really God's good things as oppressive and uh, saying they need to be destroyed and torn down so that we don't get oppressed anymore. Uh, I I do wonder, you know, the critical theorists, what are they going to believe when the West is gone? because all their beliefs are defined by criticizing, critical of Western institutions. So it's not really a philosophy at all, it's just an attack, it's a destructive force. Um, So there's critical theories, there's postmodernism, there's radical individualism, the rise and triumph of the modern self, as Carl Truman puts it, Uh, this, uh, we're going to get into this aggrandizement of the self above all things, this elevation of our own hearts and our own identities to be the guiding light of our lives. Uh, All of this stuff is happening, It's very different to Christianity. Now, there's a historical parallel there, but there's another way in which the Bible uses Babylon as well. The Bible uses Babylon as a metaphor too. Uh, Cultures with certain similar features were sometimes called Babylons in Scripture. Uh, Tyre, Nineveh, Rome, and then in Revelation, the great final Babylon the Great. Wherever that is, whatever that is, I'm not planning to tell you this evening, Uh, otherwise... It could get very interesting very quickly. Um, So we're not going there. But uh, it's actually a metaphor that's stuck. You know, there's a Hollywood blockbuster called Babylon. Uh, There's actually a uh, restaurant slash nightclub in Brisbane called Babylon. And it's interesting, they mean when they say Babylon what the Bible means when it says Babylon. Um, Isn't that strange? Uh, But anyway, it's stuck, it's a metaphor. And you say, well, what are the features of a culture that you might say is a lot like a Babylon that you see in Scripture? Well, I'll tell you what the number one feature is. The number one feature is that it is founded on a philosophy of pride. Pride. And I know this, by the way, uh, Answers in Genesis uh, talks a lot about Genesis 1 to 11, uh, and Babylon actually begins in Genesis 11. So this whole series of, from my talks is really like a really massive tangent from Genesis 11 uh, and that's how it's an AIG thing, that's my story anyway and I'm sticking to it. Um, but if you go to Genesis 11, you see the first place where they built something that looked like a Babylon and it's heavily associated with ancient Babylon in the Bible. Um, and what's their founding philosophy? Come, let us make a name for ourselves. Let us make a name ourselves and that means a few things, that plays out in a few ways. One of the ways it plays out is the belief that our power is the ultimate power. We are all there is, we are in charge of our own destiny. That's the belief today, Uh, we can take control. It's interesting, this is across all sides of politics now. Uh, I was in London in September last year uh, at a conference called the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship, some of you might have heard of it, uh, it was uh, established by Jordan Peterson and a bunch of others and all, you know, everyone who was anyone in the sort of almost slightly conservative through to conservative world was all there. Um, and it was interesting, at the end of the one day, I turned to the people around me and I said, you know, um, during this conference today, I wrote down the main point of every session. I said, I want to read them to you. And I went through the main point of each session. And then I said to them, has it struck you that every single one of those points is explicitly 
of biblical teaching. Explicitly. In fact, the environmental session was so nuanced toward a biblical perspective, it was kind of uncanny. And they all said, yeah, that's, that's true. But here's the thing, that entire conference, this is what it felt like anyway, and I think it's pretty well on the mark, that entire conference was about saying, wow, look at all the good things we used to have in the West. So, we want them back, but we'll do it ourselves. You know the thing they're missing, the good things that the West had, there's a sense in which we didn't even do them. God granted them to us. They were God's mercies, God's graces. They were God's work in people's lives. And here is a bunch of people saying, we'll do it again, this time we'll do it ourselves. And Jordan Peterson gave his talk, we are going to tilt the world towards heaven, he said. Um, he said a lot of other bad things too, actually, and I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. I wasn't sure how that would be received. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'll give you one example, and this is just an interesting point. I, I've learned a lot from Jordan Peterson, so I've got to be a little careful, but you've also got to realise where he f- falls short. Well, more than falls short. Uh, one of the things he said at the conference was he talked about faith, and he actually uh, like exegeted part of the Scriptures where it talks about Abraham, And he said, Abraham had faith and it was counted to him for righteousness. And he says, what's faith? He said, well, faith, he says, it's casting your vision of the future on the waters of the future and then taking responsibility to see that it happens. Whoa. Um, Literally the opposite of what the Bible says. Uh, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Um, see the difference? We will do it ourselves, says human pride and human power. Uh, well, actually, we can't do it ourselves, we need God. And it's interesting, then they'll say, oh yes, well, we need God too. You know, God was good for us, we need God back, you know, uh, we need to start, you know, uh, talking about Him in public and, and, and having Him in the parliament and all this kind of thing. I think, well, yeah, so you want God on your terms, to make your life better and make your culture better and make your nation better, do you? God doesn't come that way. God comes on His terms. And do you know what God's terms are? The cross of Jesus Christ. Nothing less than repentance. And that's actually what's missing uh, in all this talk. Uh, Without repentance, without restoration, without turning from sin, there is no hope. Uh, It's the hope of Nineveh that we have. And Nineveh's hope was repentance. And it's amazing God holds out His mercy waiting for that to happen and that's really the West's final opportunity that we repent and turn to God and I pray that happens. It could happen to Nineveh, shocked Jonah, didn't it? Uh, Maybe we'll all be shocked. Um, Anyway, we'll get to more on that. Now, that's one issue in which the human power becomes the greatest thing but there's something else, you think of that phrase, come let us make a name for ourselves, it sounds like the modern world in another way, It sounds like the modern world in the sense that we have individualized that ethos. Let us make ourselves great. Literally, let's take the self and make it great. That captures a lot of the sort of philosophy that is being embraced by the next generation. In fact, I can prove it to you. I can prove that we're a culture that is built on this kind of pride. I can prove it because it is a culture that has taken the word pride and made it into a marketing slogan and nobody bats an eyelid. Pride! Pride. A wicked sin. And yet it's become a marketing slogan, it's become good business, it's become a festival, it's become a parade, it's become uh, become good life advice, it's become a way of living. It's wrong. Pride never got anyone anywhere good. Pride never got any culture anywhere good. Uh, You know, it would appear that pride is the reason Satan fell from heaven. Um, We've individualized this ethos and it's just in the marketing that's all around us. Uh, You know, be yourself, be your best self. You do you, love yourself. You're beautiful, you don't need anybody else. There's only one of you, you're special and unique. Uh, The world needs you to be authentically you all this kind of stuff. Now that I've said that, if you think about it, when you go into life tomorrow, you'll see it in 10 different places. That kind of talk. 
Uh, in fact, every time I do speak about it, somebody goes to a restaurant or they go out on the street and they'll see someone with a T-shirt on. Uh, a team member sent me a photograph of someone wearing a T-shirt saying, love yourself. Uh, and people see it all over the place. Um, and it's interesting, when you think of, you know, be your best self. Well, you know, that's the sort of life advice that Gandhi could follow. And it's the sort of life advice that Hitler could follow. Isn't it? Because it doesn't mean anything. Except, whatever you are on the inside, that's the biggest and most important thing. Your true self, your identity, that's the thing that you should live in submission to and in pursuit of. That should be the guiding star of your life. Whew. You know, um, it's a problem spiritually because God says that He dwells with the one who is of a humble and a contrite spirit. He dwells with the one who is not so full of self that they believe that they are gods. They, he dwells with those who are so emptied of self that they know their need of God. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who know their self-poverty, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not other people, those people. It's sobering, isn't it, when we live in a culture of narcissism, a, a culture that just tells young people, be you, do you, love you, whatever you are, make it great, go live your life, it's all about you. It's very concerning, you know, and we wonder why the clinicians are telling us that there's an incredible rise in narcissism in our day. Well, you don't say. She couldn't see that coming. Uh, if it's all about you, well, that's the very definition of the problem. Um, and, you know, this sort of vaunted pride that we see and are taken aback by, you know, that's at the peak of this prideful culture. But there's actually something at the base of this prideful culture which is much more subtle. You know how I know that pride is rubbing off, this individualized ethic of pride is rubbing off on everyone today? It's because it seems to me that people are less teachable than they have ever been. People are more offended by truth than they have ever been. People are more prepared to dislocate their circumstances, walk away, cut you off because you said something true that they didn't like than ever before. Pride. There's no humility. People are not prepared to have that humble and contrite spirit and say, you know what, I am not the truth. My truth is nothing. I only have opinions. The truth is something else altogether. And you know what, there is the truth and we can do one of two things, we can submit to it or we can rebel against it. Uh, and how we need to get back to that posture of life that submits to truth and that actually bends our will, that actually changes our minds. Uh, Romans 12, you know, uh, it says that it is the renewal of our minds that changes our whole person so that we might live lives that are holy and acceptable to God. Um, we need to be people with changing minds, humble people with whom God dwells. Uh, you know, a Babylon culture is a culture based on pride. <clears throat> I see that around us, it's very relevant. <clears throat> it's also a culture in which you therefore start to see human rebellion take place. Um, and this is kind of, again, it follows if you, if you know the Bible, because what is exaltation of self, really? It's really, a big part of it is the exaltation of sin. Because we know what dwells in the human heart, according to Jesus. Well, well, sin, he says, he says, sin comes out of the heart of a man and defiles that person. Now, that's what lives in the human heart. Uh, we've got this really strange situation today where we think that sin is kind of disembodied in the clouds. Uh, and it's in the systems and it's in the processes and it's in the politics and it's in the culture. But it's not here, it's not me. Uh, it's all there. Where? Well, in all the other people. Oh, the other people. Um, See, one of the problems we have as human beings is that we see sin in others and we so often can't see it in ourselves and that's why we need to be humble because we need to see it in ourselves. Other people are a problem because we're a problem because human beings are a problem. Human beings have sin in the heart. Uh, and when you say to a young person, you know, just exalt yourself, you know, the reason that could be life advice for Hitler is because there's no moral boundary. Uh, there's no right, there's no wrong, there's no up, there's no down, there's no absolutes. Um, and when you don't have those absolutes, when you rely on the human heart, well, it's going to go where it wants to go. And humans are subject to lusts and desires, and it's interesting, isn't it, that this whole identity theory of life very quickly uh, goes in the direction 
of lust and desire, because that's what comes out of the heart. And what you want is not always what is right. And it's not always what is best, because you are a fallen human being. And we all know that. We're just so sl slow to admit it in practice. But there's a particular kind of rebellion that you see in these cultures, and it's the kind of rebellion that um, elevates mankind to strive to have the same authority that God has. You know, uh, in Babel, they want to build this tower whose top is in the heavens. A lot of debate over what that means. Well, read Isaiah 14. Read there where it talks about reaching up above the throne of the Most High. Uh, read Daniel 5 where the judgment is read against Belshazzar and it says, you have wanted to lift yourself up against the Most High God. Uh, look at the dream of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2 where it's not a tower, it's a tree in his dream that grows and its top reaches heaven. And the same thing happens, when the top reaches heaven, the angel comes down and destroys it. It's all over, there's judgment. It's a certain kind of pride, a certain kind of hubris in which mankind gets too big for their boots and wants to sit on God's throne and throw Him off His throne and start doing the things that He by right is the only person who should be able to do those things. They want to take the things that God has ordered in creation, for example, and they want to try and make them anew in their image. Now, they can't, but they want to try. Uh, and we've seen a bunch of examples today, and really, it's all the cultural hot-button issues. This is the problem we have. It's a, it's a kind of rebellion. Uh, I mean, when you look, for example, uh, at the issue of marriage, uh, who has the authority? From whose throne is marriage defined? The Creator. He defined it. Now, that's the real issue. I mean, why can't we redefine marriage? Well, because God defines it, not me. Uh, and God made it male and female, and we look around and we go, yeah, that's obviously true, right? There's like an apologetic in creation itself. Uh, and then it turns out that on the whole, male and female, they kind of want to be together and be with each other, and marriage seems to be fairly normal. Well, well, now we're getting into the realm where we think, well, what's going on here? And God says, I'll tell you what's going on here. I made male and female for each other to be married. Oh, that's the answer. Who defined it? God did. Is there a, a, an apologetic in His creation for that kind of thing? Yes, there is. Uh, but we come along and say, no, we want God's authority. We want to sit on God's throne. We want the power that God has to redefine what He has already defined. Uh, and it's the same in the gender issue as well. Um, when we don't... See, people think, oh, well, um, you, want to make, you want to define these things according to your preferences. No. Once God has defined all of these things, we all have to submit to them, don't we? Preferences or none. Uh, this is God's preference. And all we're saying is, well, there's the truth and I, I can either submit to it or rebel against it. And I know when it's God's truth, who ordered the whole earth and ordered all creation, which way I should go, which way is best, regardless of how I feel. And that's the... That's the, that's the flashpoint culturally that we're in right now. Because the culture says, how could you? Human pride is more important. How could you? The self is more important. How you feel is greater than the truth. Who you are is greater than God. You see the problem? That's the kind of rebellion we deal with today. We see it in the marriage thing, we see it in the gender thing, we see it in the pro-life debate. You know, we want authority over lives when God is the authority over life. He made the life, for goodness sakes. I mean, if you want authority over life, make your own. You can't. He did it. Um, and so it goes on. Um, I could go through many issues, but I go through them in my book, so buy my book and read that, uh, so that I, uh, I don't run out of time here, as I have other nights. Um, you know, it's interesting, because of the success of this kind of culture, God moves to judge. You notice in, in Babel, it's not because it's all going to fail that God says, I have to move in judgment, it's because it's going to succeed. He says, this is the only, the beginning of what they will do. Uh, and nothing will become impossible for them. In other words, they're going to pursue this stuff, they're going to use their technology, they're going to use their education system, they're going to use their uh, legislative power to keep pushing this. And there's a point at which the harm that that is doing is so great that God says judgment is better than mercy. Right? And we are on that train tonight. We're going that way very quickly. And there are broken lives... Uh, there are people who don't know who they are, who don't know what they need, and who are lost in a mass of utter confusion 
which is inflicted by a culture of pride and a culture of self-exaltation. And it's a tragedy. And God waits, but there is a point at which waiting is no longer merciful because the situation is so bad. That's what happened at Babel. Now, Babylon cultures are prideful and therefore they become rebellious very quickly. Babylon cultures are another thing too, and I'll deal with this briefly because I've got to get into the rest of my talk. Um, Two things, Babylon is hostile and Babylon seduces. What do I mean? Well, the hostility of Babylon is articulated in Revelation 17, where it says this lady Babylon is drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. She is hostile against testimony of Christ. Um, Now, we don't have martyrdom today, but we have a kind of hostility that exists in the culture. And it's very interesting, the kind of hostility is quite specific. It's a kind of hostility that exists against any testimony of the truth in relation to Babylon's idols. If you are going to get up and bring a testimony of the truth or stand out as a witness to the truth on the presenting cultural idols of the day, like identity, that's when people get very unhappy. That's when the punishment of the culture can come down on your head. That's when the workplace situation can get challenging very quickly. That's when relationships get strained very quickly. That's the kind of thing. And here's the problem. If Jesus is Lord, He has something to say about every idol. And in the days of Babylon, in Daniel's time, there were idols. And Daniel did not bow to them. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego did not bow to the golden image. What happened? Well, they were thrown in a burning, fiery furnace. We have more sophisticated idols today. You know, if aliens were to visit from outer space and they were to land their spaceship here and they had a little worksheet they had to fill out for their overlords on another planet and one of the questions on the worksheet was find out for us what this people worships, you know, it wouldn't take them long. They'd log into a social media account, they'd look at all the selfies, okay, that's interesting data, Uh, and then they would, you know, walk down the high street and they'd look at all the advertising and they'd see you're worth it, Uh, you know, uh, uh, you deserve it, Uh, you're beautiful just as you are, Uh, there's a pretty face, there's another one, and then there's someone there taking a selfie on the side of the road, and and so it goes on and on. It wouldn't be long, I mean, really. They would just say, well, it's quite clear, these people worship themselves. That would be their report. See, that's our idol today. And when you come out and say, yourself is not good, yourself is leading you into prideful rebellion, watch out. Oh, then you're in trouble. That's Babylon's hostility. That's nothing new under the sun. It's been like that for a long time. Uh, But there's something else about Babylon, seduction. So Babylon is um, uh, depicted as a seductress in Revelation and she's a seductress who's adorned in gold and pearls and wine and sin and all this kind of stuff. All the things she's holding out to the peoples of the earth saying, come and get it. Look at all the good times you can have. And the thing about a Babylon culture is that the common person has some access to good times and good things. Not all the access, but it's a little unusual, historically speaking, for common, the common person to have as much access to a good life as people in the West today. And you know what happens? We get very comfortable. We, uh, you know, get very locked into the life that we've been given. And then all of a sudden, we realize that we might have to give some of it up if we don't compromise. You know, if we don't go along with the culture, if we don't do actions to affirm what's happening, if we don't wear it purple on wear it purple day, or if our school doesn't change its gender policies, or if I do speak up on this issue, or if I do demonstrate my convictions in relation to the idols of this age, oh, I could lose something. Ah, now she's got you. You could lose something. And that is why there is a wave of compromise going across the Western world. I mean, Satan has had a field day over the last 10 years, especially in Western countries. Oh, a little whiff of hostility, like something as stupid as someone might write a nasty article about you. Oh, we go to water. You know, there were people in the past who went to the lion's den. We don't need much of a threat, do we? 
Because as Australians, I think what we like is a nice life. Uh, you know, in America, everyone's always hustling. They always want to get ahead. They always want to get rich. They always want to get big. Here, we're just like, meh. We're just, we just want to have a nice time. You know, we don't want to be too full on or too not full on. Or we just want things to be nice. We don't want to lose anything. We, we're the lucky country. We just want to enjoy it. Right? Apathy. That's our problem. And for the price of losing some apathy, Satan has had a field day. Isn't that sad? So the question comes to us, all right, what do we do? How then shall we live? I'm just me, you're just you, in a culture like this. And do you know what it feels like? It feels like it's so hard to have an impact. It feels like there's a lot of hardness of heart. It feels like things are changing out of our control. What in the world can we do in a time like this? And Daniel gives us the answer, um, because we're left at the end of the chronological section of the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 6, right up to King Cyrus, the king under which Daniel died, we're left with this incredible thing in verse 25, then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you, I make a decree that in all my royal dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever, his kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion shall be to the end, he delivers and rescues, he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, he who has saved Daniel from the power of of the lions. Can you imagine Daniel Andrews writing that? <laughs> That's what happened! King Darius, this man who was passing a decree that he ought to be worshipped days prior, and that was very common in the ancient world, by the way, uh, the worship of um, kings and so on was everywhere, but he was doing that one day, and the next day he says this. Now that, to me, sounds like an incredible success story. And you sit there and go, well, how did this happen? Because in chapter 1, all we had was a few Hebrew captives, conquered, swallowed up by this giant. And there's just four of them mentioned. And my goodness, all the power and might of paganism against them. How did this come about? Where did it all begin? And the answer is very simple. Do you know where it begins? Do you know where the foundation is? It began with a man who was good at his job. That was the beginning of the matter. Daniel was wise enough to handle what happened next. But there's a lesson in that. In all this madness, it was like the Mondays in Daniel's life from which a great work for God was able to grow. There's a great lesson in that. Because we have something to do in our own Babylon, which is not lofty, it's not unattainable, it's not hopeless, actually it's right in front of every single one of us and no matter who we are, whether we be great or small, any occupation, any sphere, any social circle, any network, any kind of life at all, Daniel did what he was doing as if he was doing it for the Lord and that was where God began to do the mighty work of Daniel chapter 6. You know, it's confronting because so often we think of evangelism like it's something extra. It's like I've got my secular life, my boring old architect's job, and then I've got some evangelism over here. And I finish the job and I don't know why I'm there and it's no good to the kingdom and I'm wasting my time, but I'm going to go and evangelize. And we separate it out. Um, and people become very despondent about their daily life. Especially uh, younger men, they can think, what's the point of it all? This is so boring and dumb. I don't want to persevere. I want to change. I want to go and do something for God. Well, God's put you there. God's given you a place to be. God has given you a sphere. And look, special evangelism efforts are fantastic. I'm not talking them down. There are street evangelists out in Melbourne today. Praise God, the city needs it. But... Yeah. But I want to make it clear that it is wrong to compartmentalize it from your life. We are evangelists in all that we are and in all that we do. 
Uh, you know, people used to come to me when I was doing work in the public squares and in the political arena, and one of the most common questions I got was, you know, how much do you think we should be, you know, dealing with the culture versus preaching the gospel? And what I really wanted to say was, well, what is the difference in one sense? Why pretend that we are just doing one or the other? Why aren't we doing both? Why isn't our whole life both? I mean, what's the difference between going into the public squares and pointing people to Christ and the Gospel? What's the difference between your family life and pointing people to Christ and the Gospel? What's the difference between your career and pointing people to Christ and the Gospel? There can be no inconsistency between these things. Everything about you should be arising out of one foundation. It should be the result of one organizing power in your life, namely that for you to live is Christ. And that is the case because of the gospel. And people should be able to see it in everything you do. Now, Don't get me wrong, I know 1 Corinthians 15 tells us very clearly those matters which are of first importance in the Gospel, which is that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. He was buried and He was raised again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And those are the great and the central facts of the Gospel. But you have a life which is nothing other than the product of those facts. And if it is anything less than the products of those facts, then pray that God will make it the product of those facts. Where you go tomorrow is shaped by the Gospel. The way you speak tomorrow is shaped by the Gospel. The way you work is shaped by the Gospel. Your attitude to your family is shaped by the Gospel. There's total consistency about you in everything, to what end that people may encounter in you an appetizer of Jesus Christ and an advertisement for His great work of salvation. And because of who you are and what you're doing, people will get drawn in to seek after those central facts. They will look at you and think, why, how, what? And the answer to those questions is, Jesus Christ died for me and rose again for my salvation. Um, this is our Babylon opportunity. This is how God can work in Melbourne today. Um, and it's precisely what Jesus was referring to in the Sermon on the Mount, when He said, let your light shine before men. So that what? They might think you're a good person? So that what? You might advance some cause? No, so that they might glorify your Father who is in heaven. You should be totally transparent about the source of your life. People must know why you are what you are, and you must not hide it. And that's the example of Daniel. You notice there's an avalanche of qualities that are given about Daniel early on in chapter 6. And all of these qualities arise where? From his faith. They all arise from the organizing power in his life, which is the power of God. You know, the first thing that's extraordinary about Daniel is that he survived into a new administration. I mean, it's not Babylon anymore, it's Medo-Persia, it's not Belshazzar, it's Darius. And somehow Daniel is one of the three top governors in the kingdom. How? Why? There's a hint given. It says that Daniel was appointed so that the king might suffer no loss. He was an honest man, a man of such integrity that the incoming administration said, you know what, we'd do well to have that guy in power and we will be safe. You know how hard it is? Forget ancient world. Do you know how hard it is today to find people in politics who have no self-interest? People in politics who are not going to stab you in the back. People in politics who won't rob you for their own advantage the second they get the chance and the second the numbers are on their side. Well, not Daniel, it turns out. Also, you know, he's exceptional at his work. It says here, the high officials and the satraps sought to find ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in Him. Faithfulness is a beautiful quality. Faithful to His duty, faithful to His commitment. Do you know why a man would be faithful? Because his God is faithful. 
Isn't that the extraordinary thing that we know about God, which is so unlike us? God keeps His Word, God keeps His promise, God is faithful to the end. And Daniel models it. And you know, it's becoming very easy in today's world to stand out in your work. Um, You consider the New Testament commands about servants honouring your masters. Do you know if you honour the boss at work, you kind of stand out. Most people hate the boss. Back, not in my work, obviously, but <laughs> backstabbing, you know, disappointment, uh, the way they talk, you'll stand out very quickly when you're not on that train. Or what about the person who doesn't just follow rules and cover their back? And it's the policy, it's the rule, it's the rule book, I'm just doing it to keep the money coming in, to just keep myself safe. What about the person who actually looks at you in the eye and you know that they care? What about that person? different, very quickly, very different. The person who commits themselves to go above and beyond, harder and harder in today's world, Generation Z, you'll stand out, you will. Um, The person who's honest and admits error, who says, yeah, I was wrong. The person who isn't putting themselves first, yeah, what a difference it makes in a workplace. But notice the most significant thing mentioned about Daniel, An excellent spirit was in him. People noticed this man because there was just something about him. And they couldn't quite put their finger on it. He was different. He lived different. His attitude was different. He had confidence in God in a world that has no confidence. He had peace and joy in his heart in a world of people who are got no joy and no peace and no hope. He's just different. And you know, that excellent spirit, that's the spirit of God. It's a spirit that is given to all who belong to Christ, that you might have in your being the same power that raised Jesus from the dead to work in you to both will and do His good pleasure. And there's going to be something about you and you don't want to hide it, because people looked at Daniel and they saw in him something. And it's interesting, this is the sort of thing that does make someone say, what is it about you? Are you different? It's a great moment in life if someone asks you that. Um, Give them the right answer, hit them with the gospel, Uh, don't waste your moment. But people will ask, they really will in a world like this, Um, But here's the important thing, you say, well, what is it about you? Well, you know, in Daniel's case, they knew full well what it was about him. That's the remarkable thing about Daniel, through successive administrations, everybody knew, even at the last feast in Belshazzar's day, the Queen Mother comes in and says, get Daniel, in him is a spirit of the holy gods. You know, they know who this guy is, they know what he stands for, and here is a man who lives his faith inside out, he is on the outside what he is on the inside. It's all consistent, there's no hypocrisy. And they gave him such a compliment when they said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. In other words, this is the governing principle in this man's life, we've worked it out. This man fears God, obeys God, that's the end of the matter. And so we need to use that against him. What a compliment. You know, do people look at you and say, well, I know what it is about this person. And they might not be complimentary, it might be that you're a God-botherer, it might be that you're a fundamentalist. No, it's all compliments, because um, they know what it is about you, really. And they're watching you, and that puts you uh, under a bit of pressure, right? Uh, and you might need to pray for forgiveness when you get that wrong. But it puts you on a bit of pressure in people's gaze. And people avoid that, because it's uncomfortable, and we don't like to be uncomfortable, but it's the whole point. They need to know who you are because your life needs to be drawing them into the central facts of what makes you, you, which is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, I remember when I first got into the political world, one of the most prevalent pieces of advice I got from so many people in powerful places was, don't be too Christian. Don't... (laughs) How did that go, right? Uh, (laughs) they They said, don't quote the Bible. Uh, don't say that it's because of Christianity. Just have a secular face, they said. Um, well, tell that to Daniel. 
I mean, what would Daniel have achieved on that approach? You know, to be influential, you have to hide your faith. What rubbish! What influence! I mean, none of Daniel's influence would have been recorded in the Bible because Daniel records, the book of Daniel records all the influence he had for the kingdom of God eternally. It's his testimony to Nebuchadnezzar and that man's conversion. It's his witness throughout the kingdoms of Babylon and Media Persia. Uh, It's his uh, legacy to the wise men, the Magi from the East, because he was a Magi in the East, the chief of them, who came seeking Jesus. It's the fact that he was who he was for Christ and the Kingdom of God, and everyone knew it. That's the whole point. And my goodness, we've got it wrong today when we say, well, to be influential, we better just not go there. Well, influential for what? I mean, what is the influence we are bringing here to this world? It's the influence of Christ and His Gospel. That is why we are here. We are here for total transparency and we are here by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the more people who see it, the better, no matter where we are. By the way, there is another just footnote about Daniel. There's something extraordinary about Daniel in that he knows what he believes. If you know what you believe in this day and age, you will stand out. Most people don't know what they believe. It's usually some kind of really nebulous, general, feel-good, sentimental something. I just believe in love. A lady next to me on a plane said that. It's all about love, she said. Uh, Well, firstly, you say, well, what do you mean by love? They can't answer the question. They don't have a definition in mind for love, and yet it's a life philosophy. Just a nebulous thing, or, you know, believe in yourself, as we said before. Well, anyone in the world could have that philosophy. From very good to very wicked, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, People don't know what they think. You know, I was reading, (laughs) this is, I was actually reading a book on Freemasonry the other day, and, right, uh, Uh, I haven't been working in politics, don't worry. Uh, But anyway, I got interested. I thought, well, what's this all about? And I started reading this thing. And you know, one of the phrases that jumped out at me was um, the belief, that that society in which all men agree. I thought, again, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, The society in which you can't have any opinions? Oh, well, we can have some opinions. Well, then not everyone's going to agree. It doesn't work. Hey, when you know what you believe, when you have convictions, uh, when you are who you are because you know truth, you'll stand out. That is remarkably countercultural in today's world. And Daniel knew his faith, he knew what he believed. Now you say, well, what's the reaction going to be to a guy like Daniel in that workplace? Well, don't kid yourself. Um, let's not be naive. People in this world are not always happy about this kind of thing. You know, it's interesting, one of the most significant things about Jesus is that he was good and he was hated. Those are the two massive things that jump out about his whole life. And people say he was a good teacher and he was hated, right? He was hated to death because we live in a fallen world and people are confronted by goodness and they start, some people hate it. And some people rebel against it. Don't expect anything less. You know, there's another lion. It's not the lion in the den. There's another lion in the Bible. There's a lion called Satan. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And you think, well, who is he going to notice walking around? What did God say to Job? Where have you been? Uh, not Job, Satan in the book of Job, one, uh, chapter 1, where have you been? He says, wandering around the earth and going to and fro in it. Oh. And you know what God says? Because he knows the answer. Have you noticed Job? Of course he's noticed Job. Why? Because he is righteous, fearing God and turning away from evil. And he's got an antenna for that kind of thing. And he notices that kind of thing And that kind of thing is not particularly constructive to achieving his ends. 
These people are dangerous to his cause. You know, when you read Daniel 6 and when you go home, I encourage you to go and read it, something is just in the background. And the thing that's in the background is that Darius actually has a lurking suspicion that Daniel's God might be real. It comes out, he says, may your God, in whom you serve, continually deliver you. Why would a man say that? He goes running to the den early in the morning to see if he's alive. He has a strange feeling about this Daniel. And you know, when Daniel's a righteous man and his righteousness is having an impact on someone rather strategic, you know what's going to happen. The greater lion is going to be provoked. And Daniel 6 is not just an account of how Daniel was saved from the lions in the den, it's an account of how Daniel was saved from the greater lion, how Daniel overcame the greater lion. And for Daniel, all the walls start to close in, the hostility is brewing, they're deceitful, he says, all the high officials in the kingdom are agreed, they weren't all agreed, Daniel wasn't there, there's envy and jealousy, there's pride at play, they stroke Darius's ego, they say, ooh, you could just pass this edict and everyone will worship you, wouldn't that be nice? And there's human frailty as well, there's Darius's own susceptibility to this kind of thing, this flattery. You know, think of those things, flattery, pride, envy, deceit. Boy, anyone who's been in the thick of it, in a spiritual battle, knows that those are the things. I mean, this has got to be true. Whoever wrote this knew exactly how this goes down. Deceit, it's always there. And do you know what shocked me in recent years? What has shocked me is the way in which Christian people can become deceivers. You know, I always thought that, you know, thou shalt not murder, right, that's easy. Thou shalt not steal, pretty easy. Thou shalt not lie, pretty easy. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, it creeps up on you. Do you know, uh, Jordan Peterson said something good. He said, um, he said that a lie very often is an avoidance. And, you know, people become manipulators, don't they? They let you believe something never intending to honour it, just to get through the moment, so that in the future, they can come at you and they can change it later on. They can agree to something in a conversation, but they don't really agree. They'll change it later or they'll do something different later. They become deceivers and it creeps in and the person with the agenda has to be so careful because when you have an agenda, you've got to be awfully certain that you, it's, agenda that, it's an agenda that can be achieved through honesty, through transparency. It's an agenda that can be achieved through humility. Uh, because when we get in control, we quickly become deceivers. And you know, envy and jealousy, it's another thing. Um, human pride, man, it catches out the, everybody. Um, these are always there. Uh, and Daniel no doubt saw this brewing. He no doubt felt the walls closing in. And then, you know, um, the document is signed. And here's the real crisis point. The lion's den wasn't the real crisis point, this was. Because victory for Satan would not have been dead Daniel. Victory for Satan was a Daniel stripped of his testimony. That was, the, dead Daniel might have been quite a bad outcome. Because the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, right? Uh, his testimony would have rung out from that moment. Oh no, the great lion has another agenda. The goal is a compromised man. And you know, this is what we face in our time. I was talking about that seduction of Babylon with that hostility of Babylon. The two come together. Daniel, it's only 30 days. Daniel, you're a powerful person. Daniel, you're about to be promoted. Daniel, it's going so well for you. Oh, you wouldn't want to mess it up. You have far more power if you just resist, if you just do it and carry on. You know, in the future, you can do good things. Don't throw it all away. Oh, the temptations. Well, Daniel knew a couple of things. It's like he'd read his New Testament, which makes no sense, but it is like he had. Um, James 4 and 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Stand firm. Resist. Don't be affected. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, resist him, firm in your faith, 
knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world and, ah, here's what's going to happen, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. You see, you will be delivered in the lion's den. You will suffer for a little while. You will be delivered in the fiery furnace. But God wants you to stand there because there is a great work that He wants to do in you and through you to this world. That's the recurring theme of the book of Daniel, that we might stand in those moments and that the compromised life would not be our legacy, but to stand and having done all to stand would be our legacy, that the witness that God has, that He would work in our lives, would come to pass. Um, And Daniel's resistance is incredible. Business as usual. Notice he doesn't pray any less and he doesn't pray any more. He just carries on. He's got great confidence. Three times a day, and you say, why did he leave the window open? Well, again, it's like in his New Testament. What did Jesus say? Don't light a lamp and hide it under a basket, but let it give light to all in the house that people might see your good works. And Daniel knew that his witness and his testimony was the whole point, and that's why this was happening to him. And that if he'd stopped his witness in testimony, that would have been as good as victory. And so he didn't. What an extraordinary thing. But also, he knew that he was the salt of the earth. And Jesus says, don't lose your saltiness. In other words, don't... You know, salt loses its taste when the water gets into it, the moisture in its environment seeps in, it becomes a block of nothing. You know, it's like, well, don't let the environment you're sitting in infiltrate you and change you to be like the world around you. Continue to stand apart. Continue to stand out. And he gave thanks. It says there, he gave thanks. That hit me hard. You know, Darius's Gestapo men are out in the street. You know, Daniel goes out the front door and there's one over there next to that house watching. He looks down the street, there's one on the roof watching. He starts walking to the palace to go to work, turns around, there's two behind him following. You know, you only need to have seen one movie from that era in World War II to know the terror, the dread, how dreadful that is to be in the midst of. That's Daniel's reality. He's got these people all around him and he gets down on his knees and the cost is lion's den and he gives thanks to God. Well, now there's an antidote to victim mentality, right? Whatever happens, God permitted it. Who am I to question it? And whatever happens, you know, count it all joy when you experience various trials. Why? Because if God has sent you a trial, He has a work for you to do. If God has sent you a trial, He has a stand for you to take so that He might do a work in you in that trial and He might do a work through you to your world in that trial and praise God for that. I have to finish somehow. I really do. Okay. A couple of points. Note that the testimony in the world provokes two reactions. It starts with hostility and it ends with fruit. That's Matthew 5, blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake, hostility. What does it end with? People see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. That's Daniel 6, what does it start with? Conspiracy and malice. Where does it end? Darius makes a great decree. Now that's the pattern and you will experience the hostility and you will think that that's all there is because it's so noisy and terrible. But by God's grace, sometimes He lets you see the fruit that is born from the stand that you take because there always is fruit. And this is the kind of fruit that's so relevant in days like this. And Darius gives a testimony, a living God. How did he know that it was a living God? Because he was alive in Daniel's life. A steadfast God, enduring forever. How did he know that? Because Daniel was steadfast and enduring. He didn't move. An indomitable God, His kingdom shall never be destroyed, His dominion shall be to the end. How did He know that? Because Daniel's heart was unconquerable. 
He said, if this is the kind of conquest that the King of Kings has, it cannot be destroyed. And that's the thing, the reign of Christ is in our hearts and it is indestructible until that coming day of salvation when His Kingdom shall come in fullness. And Darius saw all of that just through Daniel and he is a Saviour God, He who has saved Daniel. Wouldn't it be great in this Babylon if people could see that in us? That is our opportunity. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise and the weak things to shame the strong and that's you and me. That was Daniel and his three friends against all the powers of Babylon and they prevailed. And this is the opportunity and it starts in the Mondays of our life that we might be found faithful with an excellent spirit within us, ready to be used by God in the context that He has given to us. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And my final point, my actual final point, um, I need to leave us with this. Um, There is a parallel with Jesus in this passage and I'm very slow to say this, but here it's so uncanny, it's got to be there. You know, the conspiracy of false witnesses, The Pharisees went out and conspired against him, how to destroy him. The ruler who wished to see him released, Pilate, who says, I don't want anything to do with this man, he's done no wrong. The stone that was sealed with the king's own seal. They went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard, the same with Jesus. Someone comes early in the morning to find him. The women came early in the morning, Darius came early in the morning. I mean, it's uncanny. There are echoes of Christ here because the cross of Christ is the crux of history and it reverberates through history. And I want us to be left with this truth. It doesn't matter how far down you or I go in this fallen place in service to our King, He has been deeper down for us and for the cause of our salvation. And that is why Hebrews says He is a sympathetic and a faithful High Priest who is able to sympathise with our weaknesses. He knows by experience because He's been there deeper down than you or I and He won a victory over the great lion that was greater than Daniel's and it was a victory for you and for me to deal with our sin and gain resurrection life that can become ours for all eternity and here's the thing, everything that Jesus Christ has done becomes a resource for you and for me in our lives. His Spirit takes what is His and declares it to me, makes it over to me and yes, that's salvation, that's forgiveness of sin, that's resurrection life but you know what it is? It is the boldness, it is the strength, it is the courage to stand in the lion's den Daniel did it, Christ did worse, you and I will probably never have to do anything like it but if you wonder today, could I do it? I'll tell you what, yes you could, by the power of Jesus Christ in His Spirit towards you. Don't judge your ability to enter that lion's den by yourself, judge it by Him because He did it and therefore if if you, if you are His, He will do it in you. Thank you. I'd like to invite you to stand once again. We're going to sing the beautiful hymn Amazing Grace together and we're singing it a cappella so we can just all praise and I hear our voices praising our God in heaven who deserves all the praise that we can give Him. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now Wow.
rises and falls. They have always worshipped idols. Because the first attack was on the authority of the Word of God. I am not ashamed. The cross of Jesus Christ is an absolute offence to the identity. You know, the Bible hasn't changed, the Gospel hasn't changed. And the answer ultimately is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, we're going to do a brief Q&A, uh, but before we do that, I just want to uh, point out something which you may have received in the form of like a card like this. Um, which is our Catalyst program. So people often ask me, what's Answers in, Ge Answers in Genesis doing for Australia? The answer is a couple of things, but the first one is the Catalyst program, which is for 18 to 25-year-olds, uh, and um, it is in America, it is on-site at the Ark Encounter, and all you need to do really is pay for some airfares, and there's a very small program fee, which is heavily subsidised because of the great support of some people towards the program, and it is a worldview experience. It's not a program, it's an experience, because you're going to get great worldview lectures about the sorts of ideas and philosophies that you have to navigate in the real world of your university and work, uh, and also you are going to be able to experience all the fun of Christmas time at the Ark and the Museum, which is, you know, acres and acres of Christmas lights, Christmas concerts, etc. You'll get to volunteer as part of all of that, and we'll do a whole bunch of... It's actually a bit excessive, but we want to make it totally memorable so that uh, you will never forget the experience. We go on a whole lot of excursions, day trips, all sorts of exciting things. Uh, we are doing it in this December, in the lead-up to Christmas, and um, there are... There's details at arkencounter.org slash catalyst. All the information is on that card. Filling very fast. So if anyone has like 7 million US dollars handy, we'd love to build another accommodation centre so we can run these all year. But you never know, right? You never know you're like in a big city. So uh, that's, that's me done on that. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we've oh, I've got a microphone somewhere. Can we? My microphone has uh, departed from me, but it won't be far away. Um, assuming that you can hear me, we have 35 minutes for Q&A, and uh, we'll be quick. We have 35 minutes of Q&A. We'll be quick. Uh, you can scan the QR code still, which is somewhere. Uh, and do you, uh, do you believe in CSG evolution? Do you want to repeat the question and jump in? Okay. The question is. Uh, do I believe this in microphone is elusive. theistic <laughs> evolution? <laughs> Here it is. They manufactured one out of thin air. There you go. <laughs> uh, theistic evolution is the idea some people have. They just take what the secularists teach about evolution and add God to it. Uh, I always say theistic evolution is one step away from atheistic evolution uh, because what they're really doing is taking the secular worldview and adding it to the Bible. You know, if you start from the Bible, it's, th th there's no way you get any evolutionary ideas of man evolving from ape-like creatures or uh, animals evolving one kind into another. And besides which, if you believe in theistic evolution, you believe there was death, disease, uh, suffering millions of years before man evolved. Bible makes it clear, man's sin brought death. The whole creation groans because of Adam's sin. And uh, so theistic evolution is just another compromised position to add millions of years and man's evolutionary ideas into the Bible. And if you look at all the different compromised positions, theistic evolution, progressive creation, gap theory, framework hypothesis, threshold evolution, there's a whole series of them. They all have a common factor, taking man's ideas and adding it into the Bible. If you understand the word of God, we should judge man's ideas by God's word, not the other way around. Fabulous. Thanks, Ken. Ken, um, I'll just throw this one to you, Martin. We see many progressive woke churches in Australia, from pride flags to welcome to country. How can we tackle this issue in a godly manner? <clears throat> Start a new church. I mean, I was, I was going to say be different, uh, which is the same thing, I suppose. I mean, look, I think be different um, and equip yourself on those issues so that you can articulately uh, defend the truth on those matters to your children and the next generation, to anyone who asks, so that the Christian faith would be rid of this stuff. Um, now, I will make this prediction, um, and I know this in part because it makes sense, but also because I see the difference in Australia, which is sort of spiritually further down the sort of post-Christian pathway than America, but I notice the difference, which is that in an Australian context, there are far fewer of those kinds of churches. And it strikes me that as it becomes less and less and less culturally trendy, advantageous, beneficial, to be called a Christian or identified with Christianity, that kind of fake Christianity will just die. Like, why would you suffer that reproach when you simply believe what the culture believes? I mean, you just wouldn't. Um, and so I do predict that that kind of thing will get less uh, and that there will be a purifying of the church and that those who remain will be more serious about their faith and more vibrant in their faith because increasingly the call is, as soon as you bear the name of Christ, you are out of step with the culture. Uh, it reminds me of an encounter I had in Sydney, actually, uh, with a guy, uh, well, with the um, Catholic, uh, arch the Chaldean Catholic Archbishop, actually, uh, who had emigrated to Sydney from Mosul in Iraq, and he was the Chaldean Catholic Archbishop of Mosul. And... Uh, I said to him in Sydney, he came over on a refugee program, he'd seen people die, he was one of the last people out of that city before ISIS swept in and all the rest of it. Terrible backstory. And I said to him, um, you know, Your Grace, what was better, Sydney or Mosul? And he, before the words were even out of my mouth, he said, Mosul. And I uh, was surprised, and uh, I shouldn't have been, but I just was like, oh, wow, okay. I wasn't expecting him to be so convictional about it. And I said, why is that? He said, well, he said, in Mosul, he said, the choice was very simple, live or die. He said, in Sydney, he said, you people have a third option. It's called compromise. 
And that's really what tonight's talk was about, the compromise option that's always presented, which is the victory that Satan wants. Um, and you know, that compromise option gets narrower and narrower, and the cost of taking it gets higher and higher, the less Christian a culture becomes. And so it may well be that we see a purification of the church taking place. Um, whether or not we do, the obligation on us is to be different and speak clearly and teach clearly on these things. Thank you, Martin. Ken, someone is putting this question. How does Christian apologetics explain carbon slash radiometric dating? Okay, very quickly, most people have the idea, just for interest, um, it's hard to see, oh, I can sort of see you out there. Uh, for those of you who have heard, doesn't mean you necessarily believe or anything, but how many of you have heard that carbon dating, you know, says things are millions of years old? Just put your hands up if you heard. Okay, I want you to notice something. Do you see all those hands across the room? See, here's the issue. Carbon dating has nothing to do with millions of years. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian, a non-Christian, an atheist scientist, anyone who knows about carbon dating realise that's not the dating method. It has to do with millions of years. Now, rubidium strontium, potassium argon, uh, uranium lead and so on, they're the ones that give these dates of millions of years, supposedly, but not carbon dating. Carbon dating, the half-life of carbon, uh, radioactive carbon-14 is just over 5,000 years, and so after about 100,000 years, they say uh, radioactive carbon would be not detectable. So you can only use carbon dating up until about 100,000 years or so. No, I don't believe in 100,000 years. I only believe in 6,000 years for the whole universe. Uh, because God created everything in six days and we've got all those genealogies and you add up all the dates and so on. But the thing to remember is that every dating method, carbon dating included, every dating method has assumptions. They're all, and all those assumptions are fallible. There's only one infallible dating method, it's called God's Word. And all the other dating methods are fallible. And if you list the assumptions, I mean, you think about it, you're, you're doing something that involves a change with time. You have to know what was there, you have to know what's happened, you have to know changes that occurred. There's all sorts of assumptions involved. And so don't get the idea that those, all those dating methods are trustworthy. They are not. 90% of them actually contradict the billions of years. Most people don't get to hear about that. But had you got the books that we brought here tonight, you would know the answer. Uh, because in, in the answers, in answers book one, there is a great chapter there dealing with carbon dating. Might I say, those books that we brought are the cream of the crop. I'd say the cream of the crop is the basic cream of the crop of our apologetics materials. And I would encourage you to get them. You won't get them for those prices at any other time. And we're shipping them to you free. And uh, also you get the, if you buy one of the packs, you'll get free Answers TV for 12 months. It's an incredible. I, you know, we pause for a commercial. Uh, so <laughs> you may go on, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, that's terrific. Martin, what do you see as the future of homeschooling in Australia? Should parents be required to teach to the Australian curriculum? Um, <clears throat> I think, well, the future of homeschooling is that homeschooling is going to grow a lot. Um, you know, we've already seen orders of magnitude increase in the practice just in the last few years in every state. Um, increasingly, it's um, becoming the last choice for parents who want to protect their children from the way the world is going. Uh, and who want to have oversight of what their children are hearing and learning. Uh, when you send kids to government schools, increasingly you just cannot trust the situation. Uh, you have activists and ideologues all over the place. Uh, you have dodgy curriculum about identity and all the rest of it everywhere. Uh, and you have an increasingly difficult environment for them. I, I would probably um, just say this. Um, homeschooling is not a panacea. It's not, your kids are not going to be saved because you homeschool them. Um, you know, kids go off the rails who have been homeschooled, just as kids go off the rails who have not been homeschooled. So don't think that your, that salvation is found in homeschooling. 
the reality is, I mean, I was not homeschooled. Uh, I went to a big mainstream secular university twice. Um, and the reality of my situation is the reason I didn't go off the rails is because I was truly saved. I was born again, had the Holy Spirit within me. And I knew what I believed. Um, and because God enabled me <laughs> to put all that into practice. Um, so it's not a solve all, but for those who are faced with the dilemma of protecting their children from the world as it is going and the stakes are getting higher and higher and the wickedness that is out there is getting stronger and stronger and the checks and balances are getting weaker and weaker, it's a perfectly good and decent thing to do to protect your children from all of those things. And I would say that if you have children, that's like your first calling in life before God, uh, as Ken was saying in his talk. Um, and so, whatever you can do to protect them spiritually is right and good. Now, I think that in the homeschool world in Australia, we need a lot more resourcing. Um, there are some American outfits that put out quite a lot of comprehensive curriculum. Answers in Genesis does a Bible curriculum, uh, a Bible curriculum for all ages and so on, so I would really encourage you to look at that. But we are really looking at what we can do to add more resourcing especially of an international kind, so it's not an Americanized curriculum or anything like that, it's an Australian one. So we are looking into all that, but it's interesting, I, I sort of said that a while ago and everyone's been asking me constantly about it ever since. You know, these sorts of big ideas, they take quite a while to click and come together and bring together the right people and invest and, you know, it takes more than a year, hopefully in five years we'll have something good to start with. And I just want to say there are some exciting things taking place there in both content and technology for our homeschooling resources. Fabulous. Thank you, Martin. Well, Ken, people seem to want to put the science questions to you. And here's one from Craig. Stars and galaxies are apparently millions of light years away. If this is so, how do we defend a 6,000 year creation? You know, if I can... Um if I can say it this way, uh, one of the things that we need to do is start from Scripture and make sure we know what Scripture teaches. And then if there's something that seems to contradict it, that doesn't mean Scripture is wrong, it means there's something we don't understand about what, what is happening out there. And I say that because I think the lesson for all of us, and I, I often say this, all of us need to be like Job. When you read what happened in Job 38, 39, 40, 41, I mean, Job went through a terrible time and then Job was sort of going to justify himself before the Lord that, you know, I've, he's been a good man and so on. And then God said, Job, listen to me. And then jo God spoke to Job and he said, do you know this and that and what about that and how much of this do you know and can you understand this and you do... And he goes through all of these things in Job 38, 39, 40, 41. And in 42... Job gets it because Job says, I now see who you are. I now understand you. You know all things. You can do anything. You can do all things. I repent in dust and ashes. And I think we've got to get to the position of saying this. God knows everything. We know nothing compared to what God knows. Think about it. An infinite creator God, infinite in wisdom and knowledge. How much do we know compared to God? We know nothing. And the scripture talks about that, that knowledge puffs up. And you can have a million PhDs from a major university and compared to what God knows, you still know nothing. Really, think about that. And so that is something that's always, for me, very, very important. And that is, I take God's word first. And when you take God's word, he created everything in six days. You've got all those genealogy. There's only, there's only 6,000 years you can account for from Scripture with that history if those days are ordinary days, which they are because the Hebrew word yom qualified by evening, morning, number or night means, it, means it's an ordinary day in that context. And then I would say this. How much do we know about light? Does man know everything there is to know about light? Does man know everything there is to know about space? Does man know everything there is to know about what's happened in space? with light and how it travels. I mean, we don't even know how much we don't know. 
Think about that. Because no matter how much you know, there's an infinite amount more to know, which means no matter how much you know, you don't know how much more there is to know anyway, which means no matter how much you do know or don't know, you don't know how, how well, anyway, you don't know much. That's the whole point. <laughs> so the other thing is that God finished his work of creation. So the process is used. Look, he said he made the sun, moon, and stars on day four for signs and for seasons for the earth. So the light was seen on earth. How did he do that? Oh, I have no idea. He's God. And then he finished his work of creation. So whatever processes he used have finished anyway. So how can we in a present world, that's a, in a fallen creation, try to go back and understand that? And You, you, you know, you're not going to have, I don't believe, a definitive answer to things like that. But we will find over time, just like, how many times have they said, oh, th this organ didn't have a function, the appendix didn't have a function, rip it out, you know? Um, when you're healthy, rip it out. When you're sick, rip it out. I mean, that's basically it in the past. Oh, now they found it's got lots of functions. You've got to try to protect it. Uh, in other words, there's things they didn't know. We will find out a lot more about light and be amazed. We'll find out a lot more about space and be amazed. But even then, we'll hardly know anything. So don't judge God's word by what seems to be a problem out here. Use God's word to say, yeah, we don't, we don't know everything. And you're not going to have the answers to everything. Be prepared to say, you know what? I don't know. I don't explain that. But, uh, but you, the one thing I will add, though, is if you take the same assumption in regard to the supposed millions of years for light travel, the secularists, using the same assumptions, can only get light halfway across the universe, which is why they have a light time travel problem. So they have to have these inflation theories and superinflation to try to ex expand things and get the light out there. Everybody, no one can answer the question. That's the bottom line. Oh, no, sorry. God's the only one who can answer the question. I want to I want to yes, pick up on something. Please. I agree with everything Ken said, uh, but there's an interesting point, which is that Job said, <clears throat> "I repent in dust and ashes," and Abraham said, "Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes." And in my book on identity, when I go through the pieces of the puzzle that Genesis gives us about our identity, who we are as human beings, I don't just talk about the image of God, uh, inbreathed with the breath of life. I talk about the fact that we're made from dust. You know, that's the other side of the coin. You know, if we, if we forget that we're made to image God, then we will be enslaved to the debasing effects of sin. We'll think of ourselves as animals. But if, we'll forget, if we forget that we were made from dust, we will think of ourselves as gods. We'll forget, we'll, we'll be enslaved to the prideful effects of sin, the arrogating effects, the pompous effects of sin. And we live in a pride culture. Um, and one of the things we are so slow to come to terms with is exactly what Ken was saying, which is how small, finite and ignorant we really are. Um, and I <clears throat> did a video once about these high-profile people who have deconstructed their faith, and uh, I read their stories, and every story had the same features, they all had the same reasons, it was like I was reading the same story. And there came a point in nearly every story where they said something like, if I was God. You know, if I was God, children wouldn't get sick. If I was God, homosexuality wouldn't be immoral. If I was God, I would just show up and reveal myself. And I'm like, how do you get to a place where you think for one second that you could ever possibly have what it takes to be God? How long would the universe consist and hold together if you became God? it would be an immeasurable amount of time before everything de-atomized and fell apart because you don't have the power to hold it all together. You don't have the power to make it submit to your grand and eternal plan for all eternity when evil itself and all pain and suffering will be wiped out. Uh, and the great example is the, the scoffers at the cross where they came up to Jesus and they said, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, come down from the cross. And it's like they couldn't understand why God would get into this situation because they're dumb. They don't know. We're all dumb. I think if I was God, I wouldn't be on a cross. That's not the way God's act. Well, I sure am glad they're not God because there would be no gospel. There would be no salvation. And the wisdom of God is wiser than the foolishness of men. We need to come to terms in days like this with our smallness. <clears throat> Hey, Dan, I don't want this to go on for millions of years, but I just want to add one more thing. 
<laughs> this well, is you, the problem. You, once you we start, I don't know, I once we start had, doing this, it keeps yeah. uh, But <laughs> often, you know, I find people have all, have questions about Genesis. You know, but, but how could light get there from the further star, and or how could this happen, or whatever? But you know, you go to the New Testament. I don't hear the same people saying, "Well, how could there be a virgin birth?" Well, how could Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead? I mean, how did he do it? We don't know how. He, we know he did it by his word, but I mean, Lazarus is dead. His DNA was breaking down, and and uh, you know what? Ha, ha, you have to restore all your muscle function, and I mean, how do you how do you do that? We don't know how to do that, but God does. By his word, he does. So, you know, we've 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 got to see who God really is. And uh, just like Martin said, yeah, we're just dust. I'll put the next question to... Thank you very much, Ken, for, and Martin. Very well answered. Um, the next question I will put to um, you both, or either or. Um, well, we do both anyway. I, I know, Ken, <laughs> I know. Um, this is from Benjamin. How do we pre-evangelise to people in the LGBT community? In brackets, closing the gap between worldviews to get a greater opportunity to preach the gospel. Can I make a quick point, and then Ken will have something to say? You but never just... make a quick point. <laughs> I never make. That. <laughs> Guilty as charged. Yeah. Um, you know, it was the finale tonight, so I did go over time. I felt like you know, might as well give it all I've got. Um, so, where was I? Uh, oh yes, I wanted to pick up on a word in that question pre-evangelize. In other words, you know, pre-evangelism is non-evangelism. Um, and there's no such category. You know, this has really crept in. And, and look, I'll tell you, we had dealings not long ago with um, a Christian radio station. And the Christian radio station would not run ads for us. Uh, and they wanted to change them. And they wanted to change the line where we said that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only answer for every generation. And this is one of these pre-evangelism radio stations. In other words, not evangelism. In other words, totally compromised, achieving nothing. Um, so, what do you do with people in communities that may be hostile to Christianity? You evangelize them. Uh, you don't pre-evangelize. You just live the life you're supposed to live, you answer the questions that arise, and you point them always to Jesus Christ with energy, with vigor, without compromise, and without apology. Uh, and it's interesting, one of the um, unexpected outcomes uh, of the last five or six years, uh, when I was doing a lot of online content, a lot of media, and it's just the way of the world at the moment, you know, the flashpoint issue between sort of um, uh, Christianity and the culture is the LGBT issue. And so it just comes up all the time. And so I would always be answering it, I'd always be talking about the gospel, I'd always be saying what needed to be said. People would constantly say, why are you always on about that? Why can't you talk about something else? You know, I was so encouraged um, in recent, the last couple of years, hearing testimonies from people who were in that community and who have actually been saved and have actually changed because they heard this stuff. Um, and I've had, I think, five separate individuals now come back to me with those stories. So don't ever believe that by being convictional and evangelistic you're going to alienate anyone. Some will hate it, that's the world we live in, but some will be saved and for them it's worth it. So, your favourite verse must be a day is like a thousand years. <laughs> I, yeah, it wasn't a quick answer, I know. Yeah. So, let me give three quick points. <laughs> now, number one, uh, in the book pack out there, I have a book called Gospel Reset, and I would encourage you to read that. One of the things that I'm saying there is when Peter went to evangelise the Jews, in Acts 2, the Jews already had knowledge of Adam and Eve and understanding of one God and so on. He hadn't, didn't have to deal with those. So they understood the fall, they understand the promise of the Saviour. Their stumbling block was that Jesus was the Messiah. They already had the foundational knowledge to understand the Gospel. When Paul went to the Greeks, 
the Greeks didn't have that foundation. They were an evolutionist-based culture. They had many idols and altars and so on. And so he had to start at the beginning to define who God is. And, you know, and God made of one uh, man from one blood, all nations of men and so on, to lay the foundation so they would understand the gospel. And it was then uh, that he then got back to the resurrection, so didn't uh, in any way avoid talking about that so that they would understand the gospel and people were saved. And I've actually had seminary professors say don't use the method Paul used because only a few were converted and when Peter went to the Jews thousands were converted but Paul was going to outright pagans he didn't have a clue that was that was the issue and so I'm encouraging us that to understand that our culture is much more like the Greeks now not like the Jews as it was in the past it's an Acts 17 culture not an Acts 2 culture and that affects the way we do evangelism but then I'd also say this you know I've we, I, I encourage people to evangelize foundationally. And what do I mean by that? I, I had a man come to me at a conference and he said, I'm gay uh, and I believe in gay marriage. What do, what do you say about that? Um, and for some people, they would say, well, do we answer and say that's sin or whatever? But I look at that and say, that, that's his worldview. I have a different worldview because I'm starting from, from scripture. And so what I said to him was, well, as a Christian, I build my thinking on the Bible, and these days you've even got to define what the Bible is, because increasingly some of them have no idea what it is. This is a book that claims to be the Word of God, who knows everything, and tells us who we are, where we came from, etc. And my thinking starts there, and particularly in the first 11 chapters, it gives us a foundation. And, and I said, so can I explain uh, why I believe what I do? And he looked at me and he said, well, I don't believe the Bible, or whatever that is, don't give me that stuff. Just, you know, give me some other things, or whatever. And um, you, know, you know one of the most asked questions I've been asked by Christians over the years? When somebody doesn't believe the Bible, how, uh, what's the best arguments to use with them because you can't use the Bible? There's actually some, some preachers in America that actually preach, who have had thousands of people in the congregation, you can't use the Bible with a non-Christian. Remember this, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It's God's Word that's sharper than a two-edged sword. So I say to the person, you don't believe the Bible? Well, guess what? I do. <laughs> and I'm going to start from here, and I want to share with you why I believe what I do. But let me ask you a question. What do you be where did you get your beliefs from? What do you believe? How do you determine what's right and what's wrong? Can anyone else have, have a different right and wrong to you? you? You argue foundationally and witness to them foundationally. And so the third thing I wanted to mention was to practically apply that. When I went to the University of Central Oklahoma, it's a long story, but... I was asked to come and talk to a Christian group. The LGBT group got me cancelled because I believe marriage is a man and a woman. It created furor in the, in the political scene, in the media. And anyway, I got invited to come and give a public lecture, which I did. And the LGBT group all came and sat in a row there staring at me and professors from the university and all the rest of it. But what I did was I went in there and, and, and I said, look, I'm a Christian, I start from the Bible, and I went through Genesis 1 to 11, and all that uh, history in Genesis 1 to 11, and said, here's what we believe as Christians and why. And I gave some little apologetics arguments as I went through. I talked about abortion, I talked about the whole gospel, I talked about the flood, I talked about marriage, I talked about gender, I did all that. But the difference was, I kept saying, but if you have a different starting point to me, you're going to have a different worldview. But I start here, and, and so in... in the long run, the argument is not up here because that's why the emotionalism, that's why they accuse you of hate speech because they see it as a clash of worldviews. Get the argument down to the foundation. And so at the end, one of the LGBT people said to me, said in a question, well, I, um, I'm a Christian and I am um, LGBT and, and I believe in gay marriage and God spoke to me and told me that's okay. And my answer was, well, um, if, the, you know, if this is the same God we're talking about, his spoken word won't be contrary to his written word. And I'm saying it is because of my understanding of Genesis. So our real argument is, why do you have a different view of Genesis to me? We can't argue up at this level until we get this down here uh, fixed with. And so I encourage people, the more that you argue foundationally, and I had professors, non-Christian, come up to me at the end and say, you took the emotionalism out of it because they expected me to come in with hate, what they call hate speech. 
But when you deal foundationally, this is why I believe what I do, it comes from here. You have a different foundation. I recognize your worldview. You're consistent with your foundation, but we have a different foundation, so we're going to clash at this worldview level. And I found when you do that, it takes the emotionalism out of it, and I think that's the way we need to witness to people. <clears throat> I've been thinking about how to articulate this, but I want to say <clears throat> something, and it will be quite quick, I think. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, it says 524. There is, <laughs> there is something here, like, there's, so, there's something in the question, which I was trying to nail in my head that I was uncomfortable with, which is this tribalization. It's like if somebody believes or feels or perceives themselves to be what the world calls gay, then they are not a Christian and they're at war with Christians. You see what I'm saying? There's, there's a tribalism here where the culture has led people who have a certain felt identity to believe that um, Christians are against them. And it can just help sometimes to break down that wall just a bit. Uh, and an example would be um, on Q&A when Trent Zimmerman, a gay MP, said, uh, are you saying that I have to repent of being gay? I will never repent of being gay. And I, my answer in that context was, well, it's not just a gay thing, it's not just a trans thing, it's a person thing. The scriptures say God commands all people everywhere to repent. And the day that I found out I was a sinner going to hell was the best day of my life because it pointed me to Christ and it sent me to repentance and that was the solution to everything and it's the same solution for all, right? And regardless of how someone feels about their identity, that's the gospel. Now, you're never going to ultimately avoid the issue. They're going to say, well, I feel this way, I want to act on it. You say, well, let's have a conversation about that. Uh, but, you know, um, homosexual desire is, is a category of desire, it's a category of lust, it's a category of instinct, and that is common to the human condition. We all have lust, we all have passion, we all have desire, different ones, different things afflict us, we all repent of them, because there's one desire, one set of passions that God has said, this is my design for passion and desire. It can help to do that work of um, just easing that barrier. Now, you're never going to avoid the issue and you shouldn't avoid the issue. I'm not saying that. But it's always useful just to point out that it is one gospel for all. It is one repentance for all. Thank you very much, Martin. <clears throat> well, we've, we've heard the word design and um, bearing in mind we have about three minutes to go, so we'll, we'll be quick, but here's a question about design. Who designed God? If if no one designed God, and if he, if he is timeless, and he existed eternally in an uncaused fashion, why can't nature exist in the exact same way? I, I know we're, um, we're short on time, so let me do this very quickly. One of the things that I, uh, I spoke on in Perth, um, I, I dealt with a little bit more about apologetics, and talked about DNA, that DNA, which is that molecule of heredity that builds life, that DNA is an information system. And it's also a language system. It, it actually has the information uh, to make a language to read the DNA. And that there's no law of nature uh, that shows that matter can produce information. There's no law of nature that matter can uh, produce a language system. And not only that, you've also got all, you've got the laws of nature which are not material. So if you're going to believe in a material universe, where did they come from? And the point is that obviously there has to be a designer, there has to be an intelligence to make life. And so the Bible says in the beginning God, it doesn't argue for the existence of God, it says God. And we read through scripture and find out about that God, that he exists in eternity. In other words, he's always existed. We will never understand that. We are finite beings. We are created beings. And I, I explained it, you know, when I explained it to kids, when I had the little kid ask me one day, you know, where did God come from? I said, well, well, 
um, or who made God, he said. I said, well, if somebody made God, you have a bigger God. Then you've got a problem, who made the bigger God? You have to have a bigger, bigger God. Who made the bigger God? Made God. And then you've got a problem, who made the bigger, bigger God? You made, have to have a bigger, bigger, bigger God. Made a bigger, bigger God. Made a big God. Made God. And then you've got a problem, who made the bigger... And so it goes on. The only thing that makes sense is you've got to have the biggest God of all, the infinite creator God of the Bible, who eternally exists, who is a, an infinite intelligence, who created the laws of nature, who created matter, who created everything, and that's why the scripture says without faith it's impossible, right? Atheists have a blind faith because their faith lacks credulity, it doesn't even make sense uh, that, that matter somehow either eternally existed or matter came into existence by itself. I mean, if, if, you, if you don't believe God eternally existed, where did energy come from? Where did matter itself come from? How do you, what eternally existed? It, it, it makes much more logical sense to believe an eternal God, like the Bible said, who brought all these laws into being to create uh, the universe. And the reason nature can't exist in the same way is because nature is not God. It's a really important point, actually, in today's world, that nature, creation, is not the creator. Uh, that is a kind, that's pagan, the worship of created things, or the deification or spiritualization of created things, is, is, neo is a kind of paganism. Uh, and we're seeing that a lot today. That's why you see, like, self-expression, and, like, sexual desire and lust is now all spiritualized, like it's a completion of the self, and that's spiritual. Well, that's pagan, that's ancient. It's been like that for a long time. That's why you see the, the, the exaltation of the earth uh, as if it's some great unspoiled glory until human beings come along. It's the deification of the planet. We've got to avoid all that stuff. Uh, nature is not God. God is apart from nature. And nature points us upwards to the transcendent creator God, says Romans And 1. actually, Romans 1, <laughs> yep. if you read Romans 1, it, it's got all that there. Yeah. And, it, you know, we read that and we're now seeing it play out before our very eyes. When they reject the creator, then they worship the creature rather yes. than the creator. And so it goes on. And then the, you, you see a, a, a whole progression of, you know, sexual perversion and uh, so on, as you see in, in Romans 1, what happens when man abandons God and God turns them over uh, to their debased ways. I just, um, we are out of time, but just two very quick questions. <clears throat> one about um, Creation Museum and one about the Ark Encounter. From Nate, when is the Australian Creation Museum going to start construction? <laughs> when, I, yeah. when someone can donate $100 million i tell you what I would like to do. I would like to build a children's museum in Australia, um, a, like a, a Christian Questacon on steroids. Um, I think that would be incredible, and I think that that would get a lot of people. But, like Ken said, land prices in this country, yikes, especially in population centres and all that. Yeah, if, if God is moving on your heart and you've just come into a lot of money, anyone secretly won the lottery? Um, I have a deal for you which you cannot refuse. <laughs> but you know what, um, America, obviously the Ark and the Creation Museum are there, there's a big philanthropic base which is not here in Australia, 350 million people, there's a greater percentage of Christians, you're just going to have to come and visit and um, save up for an air ticket on a Well, on a plane. here's somebody who wants to visit the Ark encounter. This question comes from Gary who says the question's a very important one. Does the Ark Encounter Cafe have meat pies? <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Put your what, hands together for Martin and Ken. We want it to. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Hey, don't forget, uh, you'll get your free Bible, Genesis, New Testament, Psalms and Proverbs, and use it as a witnessing tool. Or give it to someone. And I'm going to take 20 seconds of your time, I know everyone's leaving, but just to say that Bible is the only free thing we're handing out outside. There's some people out there handing some stuff out, it's not ours, I have no idea what it is, so I apologise in advance. Just to say to you all, um, thank you for coming, um, we're doing Catalyst for Australians, we're also doing the Answers Army. Uh, there's a QR code on the screen, I'd encourage you to scan it, give us your details, we want to see ordinary people doing simple things to promote the gospel everywhere in this country. 
we want to resource it, we want to get Scripture into every household in Australia, we need your help to get it done. We need your volunteer support, also we need your financial support as well. Uh, we've been fortunate to subsidise these events because of people's generous support so far, but in order to reach Australia with the Gospel through this ministry, we need ongoing help. So, thank you all so much. Oh, I was supposed to say, deepest thanks to all the people who gave their time for free and travelled with us and helped us to pull this tour off. Um, I mean, we have a, an Australian board member and his family, we have young folks who came to Catalyst in December, we have people who just wanted to get on the bandwagon, help out, be part of this. Uh, very, very grateful, I won't mention names, otherwise we'll be here all night, but thank you folks. And there's one more song and we're done, so good night, thank you. <clears throat> Well, please be upstanding as we get ready to sing a final song together. But 
Jesus Christ, the Lord. We go to all the world with kingdom hope unfurled. No other name has power to save but Jesus Christ, the Lord. Thank you so much for being here tonight and being part of this. Uh, do hope you have safe travels as you leave. And of course, there are wonderful resources and things we'd love for you to collect uh, and perhaps get on the way out. So have a great night. God bless you. See you later. Welcome to Building Blocks. If this is more dense, it should flow down and extinguish all of these candles. She depends on the warm sunshine to warm her up or the cool shade to cool her down. If I were still teaching worldview classes in high school, I would show this movie. You can't Christianize a worldview that has a wrong foundation. Welcome to our program. It's called Out and About, and I'm your host, Buddy Davis. I'm Peter Schremer, and this is I Can See. It's really important for every Christian to understand this issue. This is gonna be so fun. Oh, I can't wait. It sounds like a blast. How about you? Getting excited yet? Of course. You know me. I'm up for literally anything, even if it might be a little boring. What? Boring? Gracie, tell her. Yeah, were you not listening? There's so much to do. Zip lines, ice cream, virtual reality, a zoo, and just wait till you go inside. <laughs> I guess you'll just have to see it for yourself. Well, Liz, here we are. The big moment of truth. <gasps> wow. Increíble. <laughs> Buenazo. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Let's do this. <laughs> Come on, keep up, girls. Told you, Izzy. Sometimes you just gotta think bigger. <sighs> it sure is good to be back.